Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to do a quick moment of silence um, for former counselor John Matheson's mother, Anne, passed away a couple weekends ago on Palm Sunday. She was a over 50-year resident of Bartlett Street and um, beloved by the neighborhood and wanted to just um, share a moment of silence in her memory in respect to Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to have a moment of silence for my uncle, Pasquale Simonelli, who lives, who lived in uh, McCormick Street uh, in the West End. I just want to say um, if we could have a moment of silence for him as well. Thank you. I don't know if this was the other one we were going to mention, but um, moment of silence in um, memory of Paul Hammersley's mother who passed away kind of suddenly the other day. She was 92 years old, lived on Ashland Street for um, as long as I can remember. So her funeral is um, this Thursday. Councilor Colon Hayes. Here. Councilor Condon. Here. Councilor Crow. Here. Councilor Linehan. Here. Councilor McDonald. Here. Councilor O'Malley. Here. Councilor Sika. Here. Councilor Simonelli. Yep. Councilor Spadafora. Here. Councilor Taylor. Here. Council President Winslow. Here. So um, tonight, two of our councilors, Councilor um, at Large McDonald and Ward 4 Councilor O'Malley, are participating remotely. So um, under our um, requirements for open meeting law in terms of having it, uh, people participate by Zoom, all votes to e this evening will be done by roll call. Um, so thank you that and very much. And then under the provisions. Oh, oh what, Steve, what, what, your what, mic's what, on. Sorry, my mic isn't is on. Is that what this means? Okay, <laughs> sorry. All right. Okay, thanks. I, all right. Usually my mic's on. So all right. Thank you very much. Thanks. So under, so I'll, I'll just repeat that. Um, tonight. Councilor McDonald and Councilor O'Malley are participating remotely uh, via Zoom so that all votes for the evening will be done by roll call. Uh, under the provisions of the open meeting law, for those who are you in attendance, please be informed that UMA, Urban Media Arts, will be recording this evening's meeting. Um, is anybody else planning to record this evening's meeting? So, all right, so that's, that will be there. So just be aware that there will be audio and video recordings of this meeting as a result. Uh, clerk, uh, first order of business. So, um, all right, so you, would you like to write this? Club 24 is here with us tonight. Um, Councilor Simonelli asked me to read this citation on their behalf. In recognition of their 60 years of outstanding commitment, dedication, and leadership to the city of Malden and surrounding cities, Malden residents are fortunate to have Club 24, a strong organization, reaching out to people and loved ones on their road to recovery. Thank you for your many years of service and support to the community. We are proud of your accomplishments and wish you continued success in all your future endeavors. So I just, so I will um, just want to say, given the, the, that we have a, another presentation coming up, Councilor Simon, like, keep it short, and I think that citation really, really speaks for all of us as counselors, uh, the great work Club 24, but I did want to recognize Councilor Simonelli. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll keep it as short as I can, sir. Uh, I just want to say uh, congratulations. I know we got uh, Alan Campbell here who runs the uh, Club 24 and, and, and some of his folks. And uh, both of our sons hang around together to, uh, to this day since they were kids. And, you know, the Club 24 has been around, like you said, the citation says it all, for 60-some-odd years and, and doing the good work. And they're helping me over in Everett to uh, get the uh, substance abuse program up and going. And I know they do a lot of good stuff here in Malden. And they also opened up their doors to be a polling place and has worked alongside of the city clerk. So they're a good Malden organization. And I just wanted to recognize them tonight, Mr. President. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Councilor Simonelli. And I think that it really is 
represents the view of all the folks on the council. So we're going to take a break, brief rest, recess so we can make the pre presentation of the citation and we'll just stand out here and take a quick picture. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, the next uh, guest, uh, we have representative of Malden State Delegation um, to appear before the council to discuss issues relating to Chapter 70 funding for the schools. I want to thank uh, Senator Lewis, uh, Representative Donato, Representative um, Altrino, and um, Representative uh, Lipper Garabedian, who's participating by Zoom, for coming and uh, talking to the council about this. I know in our finance committee, we had recently uh, a briefing by the mayor's office about um, you know the chapter 70 funding and what that means for the council. So we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to come here so we can discuss it directly with the state delegation and what this means for the city. Thank you. Okay, all right. Let's see, make sure I get your microphone here. <laughs> all right. So just identify yourself for folks that are watching on UMA. Oh, sorry. Let's shut it off. Okay, there we go okay. again. All right. All right. Well, um, good evening, President Winslow and uh, city councilors and members of the public. Um, thank you for your public service, and thank you for inviting the Malden State Legislative Delegation to join you this evening uh, for this conversation about... Um, public school funding for Malden and uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, you have all the members of the Malden State Legislative Delegation with you tonight. I'm State Senator Jason Lewis. Uh, we have Representative Steve Altrino, and Steve and I will sort of share duties in uh, taking you through a brief presentation. Um, and then we will certainly uh, welcome any questions uh, you have for us or any feedback. Uh, we're also joined by Representative Paul Donato, and then on Zoom, is Representative uh, Kate Lippergarabedian, and uh, we all work very, very closely on behalf of Malden, um, and certainly when it comes to recording uh, in progress, as important as school funding, uh, all four of us have been actively engaged in the in this issue, um, you know, for for many years now. And of course, we also work together on behalf of the city on many other issues as well. So we know that um, the city leaders are. Um, you know, currently dealing with some very challenging uh, financial circumstances uh, in terms of working on the city's budget for fiscal year 25 and uh, obviously a very significant and important part of the, of the city's budget is the uh, Malden Public Schools. Um, so the presentation tonight really focuses in on the way that the state approaches uh, its obligation to provide adequate and equitable funding for public, the public schools in Malden and then across all other cities and towns in the Commonwealth. Um, a, a new law that was passed a number of years ago called the Student Opportunity Act and how that has impacted and continues to impact and benefit Malden. Um, and then some of the challenges with the school funding formula and how we're working to address those. So uh, the so-called Chapter 70 formula, which just is the section of Mass General Law where it basically is written, 
uh, was put in place as part of the Education Reform Act of uh, 1993. Um, that was a major update to how we um, manage and oversee and fund public schools, uh, and this was part of, the, of that. The Student Opportunity Act, which you may have heard about, was uh, signed into law in 2019. Um, uh, some of you may know, in addition to representing Malden, I also have the privilege of serving as the Senate Chair of the Education Committee. So I was named chair the beginning of 2019 and actually had uh, the opportunity to play a significant role in getting this, uh, this law uh, passed in the House and Senate and signed by former Governor Baker. It, it's the most significant update to the formula since 1993. Uh, it took many, many years to, to, to gain the consensus to pass it. And it focuses uh, on addressing issues around adequate funding and equitable funding, specifically pertaining to how we calculate what's known as the foundation budget. Uh, and in a moment, we'll show you a slide which will explain the, the, the pieces of the Chapter 70 formula. So this will make more sense to you for those, for those of you for whom this is new. The, uh, result of the passage of this law was the state basically made a commitment to increase state funding for public schools, that's known as Chapter 78, by $1.4 billion. And that's new money. That's over and above what we would be providing just as a result of inflation because the amount of money the state provides increases every year uh, based on the rate of inflation. But this would be dollars over and on top of that. The state certainly did not have the capacity to increase funding by that much uh, in one year, so it's being phased in over six years. And the fiscal year we're in right now, fiscal year 24, is the midpoint. So we're in the third year of, of phasing in that, that formula, th those changes. Um, the Student Opportunity Act did not uh, uh, really address the other side of the Chapter 70 formula, which is the side that figures out what the local sit municipality has to contribute from its own resources. Um, and that is the part that we'll talk more about tonight because that's where there have been some, some uh, uh, challenges when it comes to the calculations for the city of Malden. So as a result of the passage of the Student Opportunity Act, the SOA, this has had a very positive impact you know, on, on, on the Chapter 70 aid that Malden has been receiving. Uh, in fiscal year 23, the city got an increase of $2.7 million, a little over 5%, and that meant the total amount of Chapter 70 that Malden received was $54 million in, uh, this was last fiscal year. That was the largest increase in Chapter 70, both in terms of the dollar amount and, and percentage-wise uh, in, uh, in a decade. So that was a pretty significant increase. And then in the current fiscal year, fiscal year 24, um, as you probably know, uh, the, the city got an even larger increase, a $9.1 million increase, almost 17%, and that took the amount of Chapter 70A that Malden was receiving in the current fiscal year to a little over $63 million. And, and again, that is as a result of running the Chapter 70 formula uh, and continuing to phase in the updates to the foundation budget from the passage of the SOA. There was also some additional benefits that Malden has realized from the SOA. Um, an a significant increase in uh, reimbursements related to the special education circuit breaker. So this is a program the state put in place about two decades ago, recognizing that students with very acute special needs um, may need to be placed out of district in specialized schools, and that can be very expensive. The state helps to reimburse the tuition costs, but up until the passage of the SOA, the, the transportation costs were left entirely on the shoulders of the city or town, and those costs can be tens of thousands of dollars. So we, the state added in transportation costs, and now Malden is reimbursed, not just for the tuition, but also for the transportation for those districts, those students that are need to be transported out of district. And you can see in fiscal year 23, that was a, about a little over a million dollars that uh, was then eligible for state reimbursement. The SOA also increased charter school tuition reimbursements. So when students from Malden go to, for example, Mystic Valley Charter School, there is a process of getting reimbursing the city at least for three years. By the way, Massachusetts is the only state in the country that actually reimburses, um, at least for a period of time, some of those costs when a student leaves a district to attend a charter school. 
uh, because the money follows the student. Um, and then finally, a, a much more accurate calculation of the low-income student population. You can see what an impact that had for Malden. And the reason that's very important is because the number of low-income students has a very big impact on the calculations of the foundation budget and therefore on the amount of Chapter 78. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Representative Altrino for the next few slides. Thank you. In, um, in speaking to some counselors, probably on a daily and weekly basis, Chapter 70 is not the only aid, state aid, that comes to the city of Malden. Besides Title I, which is millions of dollars that comes from the federal government, there's millions of dollars in grants that actually come to the city that you don't see in your budget. You'll see it in the school budget, whether it is for reading coaches, whether it's for new technology, professional development for teachers, um, a safety grant, etc. Money also goes to community organizations that partner with the school. I'll use uh, the YWCA for an example, which receives the 21st Century Grant, which, t which really provides after school care uh, for some of the lowest income uh, students in the Ferryway School. That is also a, uh, a grant that is relied upon. We say that because part of our job, not only to protect Chapter 70, is, is to also to protect the, these organizations that get grants, that you probably never see the results of the children being served, right? Just in, uh, from 2019, you'll see uh, some of these numbers in grants that have come through, and here's a specific. Uh, in education alone, you have uh, $2.1 million, if you look at the right part. Equipment and operations, public health grants, especially during COVID, that Chris Webb will tell you has been a lifesaver, whether it's uh, offering vaccines, whether it's offering uh, home care for those that were uh, homebound because of COVID, uh, equipment, um, workforce development. Again, the YWCA works with your local WIBs that offer training and career development. Uh, these are things that actually, and we also do it for children in financial literacy and what have you through grants. So you're looking at about three and a half million dollars just going to the Malden Public Schools in addition to chapter 70. Um, here's, you know, if you see uh, in front of you, here's some of the grants. These are not all of them. These are the ones that we could track that the Secretariat would tell us that you, you received a grant. We've done a little more digging, but we also miss uh, some that might go to nonprofits like the YMCA, Housing Families, Portal to Hope, YWCA, and, and a myriad of other organizations that Bread of Life. Um, which does wonderful things, and they're able to get some grants from the state. I also, just before we move on uh, to, the, to uh, some calculations, there are thousands of people, and, and you counselors know well because you'll call me, there are thousands of people in this city, uh, our first responders will know very well because they also serve some, that rely on programs from the state of Massachusetts, whether it's mass health, whether it's food security, whether it's housing vouchers, whether it's living in community housing, whether it's public safety money. Um, people will call us and ask us not to cut those light items either. And there are thousands. Just this year alone, we received about 2,800 calls for help. Just my office, the 33rd Middlesex, and I don't cover all of Malden, whether it's health care. You know, we, we have a lot of children in the school systems that's on mass health. We want to make sure. Uh, we are protecting those line items too. So you may not see it. We also took over programs that the federal government decided to cut. We feed all children now in the public schools. The, that cost about $180 million a year that the feds used to pay for that we do pay for now. Uh, the feds cut all the COVID emergency money. That is stuff that the state has. We covered SNAP benefits for three, four extra months that the federal government has decided to cut. So I, I know it's a little off Chapter 70, but Chapter 70 is really not the only pool of money that supports the 70,000 plus people in, in this uh, great city. So uh, there's just some examples of other grants. And I know counselors who work in nonprofits, uh, who are social workers, uh, who deal with constituents in need. It's not just a tree or uh, plowing the road or a sidewalk. It's people who are really suffering, especially mental health. I talked to Councilor Simonelli a lot on constituents that he calls me on that are suffering. That's also what we're trying to protect in the state.
budget as well. So thank you. Thank you, Rep. Altrino. And let me just add two quick points on this. First is that these grant programs exist because the legislature creates them and funds them. So that, that's, why they, that's why they're there. And then second point I would make is many of these are competitive grant programs. And I want to applaud and congratulate you all, the school committee, the superintendent and her team and other city staff who work you know, alongside the delegation to, uh, you know, to make a case for, for Malden to receive these grants. That's not a foregone conclusion you know, that, that the city and the school MPS are going to get these grants. It, it takes a strong you know, a competitive application in, in many cases. And I think we've done really, really well in uh, the number of different grants we've secured. All right, so back to now the, the conversation on Chapter 70. So this is basically the one slide we're using to sort of explain how this works. Um, it, it, it is a complicated formula. It, it, um, it is a bit of a black box. And again, it does determine the Chapter 70 funding level for every single school district in the state every, every year. Um, if you want to learn more than we can cover tonight, um, my office just hosted a workshop on the, on the Chapter 70 formula. Thank you, uh, Council Winslow. You, you, were, you were there and spent the time with us. But we recorded that. So anyone who wants to, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're having trouble falling asleep one night and uh, you need something to help you, you could watch the recorded of that, uh, of that Chapter 70 presentation. But basically at a very simple level, there's three pieces to it, if you will. First part is uh, calculating the foundation budget, which is essentially, think of it as a spreadsheet for every single school district, and it's calculated every year. And it, 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 it based on the enrollment levels in the district and the demographic characteristics, you know, numbers of low-income students, numbers of English learners, and so on, it calculates how, what, that, what the necessary budget is that would be required to provide a quality education for that population of students. So the, this is calculated for Malden Public Schools every year, again, by, this, by the formula. Second step in this is to calculate, OK, now that we know how much we need to fund the schools, how much of that should be paid for out of the local city or town's resources? And that's based on a measurement of the community's property, wealth, and aggregate income. And uh, once after that calculation is made, the, the final piece of the puzzle is the amount of state chapter 78, which is essentially, if this is what the schools need, this is what the city can provide out of its resources, the state's gonna make up the difference. So obviously, very wealthy suburban communities don't get only a small amount of state aid. Less affluent, you know, gateway cities, other communities with large numbers of low-income students, you know, they get a, a large amount of Chapter 78. So that's what creates equity in terms of trying to make sure that every school is, has the resources it needs to educate its students, regardless of the, um, the wealth or the uh, socioeconomics of, of the, any particular city or town. So, where the problem has been, so we had talked about the benefits of the passage of the SOA, we talked about how Malden has significantly benefited, but one area of the formula which unfortunately is not, um, uh, is not treating Malden well, and Malden's not unique in this, there are some other communities, but it relates to the local contribution side of the formula. And it gets fairly technical as to what, what is happening here, and the delegation spent a lot of time digging into this with the mayor and Ron Hogan and Tony Mertz and experts at DESE and, and others. But the bottom line is that um, every community, even, no matter how wealthy it is, uh, it doesn't have to pay more than 82.5% of its foundation budget. So even the wealthiest cities and towns in the state um, still get, because they only have to pay 82.5% of the foundation budget, they, in, they get 17.5% of the foundation budget in state aid. And when that was first put in place in 2008, there weren't that many communities that were subject to that cap. But that has grown and grown and grown. So many communities are now subject to that. And essentially, that has put more pressure on communities like Malden that are not capped communities, because Malden does not have to pay 82.5%. It's less than that. And that has been driving up the contributions that those communities who are not subject to that cap are required to uh, to contribute, and, uh, and th that is something that has been affecting, um, adversely affecting Malden. And we, in the passage of the SOA, 
we recognized that this was a concern, and even though that law was not dealing with this part of the formula, we directed DESE to work with DOR, the Department of Revenue, to look at this issue, and they did produce a study and a report, which you can read if you want to. It's um, available, to produ uh, published in, tr in December 2020. And you can see from the quote here, they basically did uh, confirm the concern that we you know, noted when we passed that law, and they acknowledged that this is a causing a problem and, um, and that this may result in significant and unevenly distributed increases in local contribution requirements for communities not subject to the cap. Malden is, is one of those. There, there are many others, but it's one of them. So it was recognized by the administration, but unfortunately to date, they have not taken DESE and the Baker administration before and the Healy administration since has not taken any steps as of yet to address this issue. Um, and that's notwithstanding our um, advocating for them to do so. So here's where you can actually see what this has meant for Malden. The two important things here are what is known as the target local share, which is what the formula calculates is the share of the foundation budget. Again, the foundation budget is the amount of money needed to educate Malden's student population. What share of that should the city be able to afford to pay from its own resources? Obviously, most of that's property taxes. And you can see in fiscal year 18, the formula said Malden should be able to pay 48%. And that's gone all the way up to 56%. Um, so an eight percentage point increase in what the formula deems is Malden's capacity to pay toward its school budget. And I think we would all, you would all acknowledge, you know, the city has seen some, some growth has, has seen uh, some um, additional development, but certainly nothing that would support you know, that big an increase in what the city can afford to pay. Now the formula does recognize that it's not realistic to expect communities to increase their local share by such a large amount. So that's why it does put a sort of a cap on that, if you will, and that's what the required local share is. So that has also been increasing most years and it's gone from 44.5% to 47, so that's increased by three percentage points. So that is the actual share that Malden is expected to pay. So it's, le it's less of an increase than what the target is, but it's still putting more pressure on the city's fi finances because it is requiring, instead of 44.5% to be covered by the city, it's requiring 47 point and a half, three percentage points more um, of that budget. So, as I said, the delegation has all worked very actively on this issue for a number of years now, many different meetings, many deep dives that we've done. Thank you also to Representative Alpino's staff and my staff, who also spent many, many hours on this issue. So there are a range of ideas that we have put forward. You know, on this slide, you can see there's no perfect solution. Some of they have different pros, different cons to them. Some of these are pretty easy to explain. Some of them are more complicated. But I just the point is here, to, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but the point is to indicate that you know, there's been a lot of thought going on in terms of what could be done, changes in the formula, changes outside of the formula that can help address this issue and to the benefit of, of Malden and other communities who are in a similar situation. By the way, one, another community that's in a similar situation is the city of Salem. And uh, as you probably know, our lieutenant governor was formerly the mayor of Salem. So we've spent a lot of time with her, both when she was mayor and since. And she is one of the people who really does understand this issue and is an ally for us in advocating for, for changes. So, um, all right, so now transitioning to the fiscal year 25. This is the fiscal year we're all working on, the state budget. Governor came out with her proposal in, was it January, February? The House of Representatives, um, big day tomorrow. The House Ways and Means Committee is releasing its budget proposal tomorrow. And then my House colleagues are going to debate it in two weeks, yeah. right? Uh, the, the, budget the budget will be debated in the House. The Senate will then take up the budget in uh, late May. And we should have a final state budget um, in ju late June. So the important thing uh, to note here is that increases in Chapter 70 aid for fiscal year 25 are much smaller across the board for almost every community in the state compared to fiscal year 24. Um, so the conversation that you're all having now and the, the, the surprise, maybe shock, 
at how much smaller the increase is for fiscal year 25 than it was for fiscal year 24, the same conversation is actually taking place all across the state. Um, it's actually taking place in several other communities that I even represent um, in my district. Um, but this, this is mostly due to the fact that the, the rate of inflation has come down a lot. And the formula is very sensitive to the inflation rate. So the inflation rate was around 7, 8, 9 percent the last few years. And uh, now the, the inflation rate that is based on state and local government price deflator is at 1.35 percent. Um, this isn't just made up for this year. The, the, the state's been using this method of, of calculating inflation for a very long time. So as a result of that much lower inflation rate, Chapter 70 is still increasing uh, statewide by about uh, $260 million or 4%, but that's half as big an increase as the current fiscal year, uh, which was an almost 10% increase. And 212 communities, um, so the majority of communities are in the governor's budget are receiving minimum aid, which is basically everybody gets at least $30 per pupil in increased Chapter 70. Many other states actually would re reduce state funding when districts have declining enrollment, for example. Massachusetts, we don't do that. We hold harmless everyone, no matter, even if their enrollment goes down, and we give them at least $30 per pupil. Malden's increase in the governor's budget is 618,000, which would take the city to a total of 63.8 million. Um, that's obviously much less than this year and, and I know less than we were, we were hoping it would be. Um, but it is worth noting that that still is uh, three times more than what the minimum aid is. So minimum aid is 30, the 618,000 is about equivalent to about $90 per pupil. So it's about three times what um, most communities are receiving, which is minimum aid. All right, I'm gonna hand it back to Rep. Altrino. Thank you, Senator. So as the Senator said, the House proposal will come out tomorrow. I'm a member of Ways and Means, so at 1030 we'll meet with the chair and we'll see the speaker's uh, version. And then we'll have uh, three days until uh, Friday at five or so to file amendments. There are usually 16 or 1700 amendments filed in the House. There are 160 representatives. And I mention that because when you change a formula, it might be great for Malden, but not great for towns A, B, and C. So to garner enough support from other state reps to change any part of the formula, add money to a certain community, it's tough for them to go home and say, whoa, we're not bringing home, but Malden's going to be taken care of. And that's why, since there's 160 reps, Representative Donato, Lippo Garabini, and I are trying to get sponsors and try to let them understand Malden's problem, because it's not just Malden's problems, problem. Um, but other communities, like the rural districts, have even larger problems and need more money. So I want you to understand, you're, you're a body of 11, and I know you folks sometimes uh, have a difficult time to get all 11 votes. Well, we have 160 partisan uh, members of the House of Representatives. The Senator has 40. So what Representative Donato, uh, Lipper Garabini, and I will be doing is we've identified four amendments. I've spoken personally to the Chair of Ways and Means. Last week, Rep. Donato did that two or three weeks ago to give him an update of where we're going to file. Now, we usually, over the governor's budget, probably put in about 50, 60 million dollars more than what she does in the House, the Senate does theirs, and by the time we're done we're at conference, it's maybe 100, or a little more, 100 something million. The First Amendment is asking for 18 million dollars for just four cities and towns. That is Bonstable, um, Malden, Methuen, and Attleboro. So those reps are thrilled. But again, that's 18 million, which is maybe 35% or so of all of our earmarks to go to four cities and towns. I spoke to the chairman. I spoke to the mayor about this. I spoke to the lieutenant governor about it. It sounds like a lot, but there's an error that needs to be fixed. And whether it's fixed through this pothole that will really only affect these four cities and towns, or start the conversation that it will affect even more as the formula matures through the Student Opportunity Act. So that's the first one, is we'll create a pothole account uh, that only those four um, communities that are under its Prop 2.5 levy limit would qualify for. And I want to thank the mayor's office. Um, 
and Ron Hogan for really helping us. We're on the phone daily with them. Uh, my aide, Lizzie, um, has lived this now for probably the last year or so. No wonder she's leaving to go to law school. It's probably going to be easier to do law school than uh, understand the Chapter 70 formula. But the second thing is amendment to allow municipalities that pay a 2% below in effort increment to cut it down to 1% cutting their below effort increment in half. Okay, now this might sound, well, this language might sound a little crazy, but that's about five million, it will help about 57 communities. Okay, something doable in my, I think it's all doable, it's up to the chair of ways and means. The third thing is pausing um, below effort. And if you pause all the increments for all one and 2% municipalities, that's 235. There's how many, 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, this would affect 235 cities and towns. Approximately, it would cost in our budget an additional 27 million. Uh, the fourth amendment that uh, the Malden delegation, the House, is filing, uh, will convene a working group. We've been asking the secretary, the last one and this one, to start addressing this error in the formula. And we, the mayor, Ron, myself, um, and uh, Jen Spadafora from the school committee uh, all went up to explain to the assistant secretary the issue, which they know, but it comes with a dollar amount, plus they'd like to see the Student Opportunity Act fulfill its, its six-year obligation. But this will force um, the secretary, not ask the secretary, but force the secretary to create this group and identify where in the formulas cities like Malden suffer and then come up with a cost with DOR and hopefully implement that cost. Because when the State Student Opportunity Act passed, and I was the Vice Chair of Education at the time, we took care of one part of the formula, the health care reimbursements, you know, transportation reimbursements. The second part of the formula says, how much can the community afford based on income of the average Maldonian and based on property values? That's where it sticks for Malden in many communities. But it took years to get to the Student Opportunity Act. And there are very, some communities that are upset that Student Opportunity didn't do enough for them. But everything goes to the gateway cities. I have to listen to that. And I said, well, we handle most of the students in the Commonwealth. Uh, so this working group, uh, Rep. Donato will file that, will uh, say we need this solution and not ask them. This will demand it. That is no cost. Okay? And again, when they come out with this report, hopefully, not every representative or senator is going to like it because you change a formula, someone wins, someone loses. Okay? The last thing, which is uh, the Mass Teachers Association, which represents most of the educators here in the city of Malden, the Mass Association of School Superintendents, Mass Association of School Committees, um, and who's the fourth one? Mass Budget. Um, and the Progressive Caucus is asking the governor to change that 1.3% inflation rate, which we know is more. Uh, and that will affect all cities and towns, but that's a $465 million approximate price tag for all the 351 cities and towns that are going from that 4.5% inflation rate to, to the one3 Okay, No matter how wealthy the town is or how poor the town is, that inflation rate really drastically um, cut a significant amount of funding, $465 million that the governor did not put in her proposal. Okay? That's a stretch to ask to add half a billion dollars uh, to it. But they have to realize that this affects everyone, every city and town, regardless of the income in the city, the property values, et cetera. Okay? Those will be filed. Um, in, um, we'll file those by Friday. We'll debate the budget uh, the 24th, 25th, 26th. The way our budget works, just to give you a, since there are 16 or 100 amendments or so, we consolidate the amendments by secretariat, education amendments, public safety amendments, housing amendments, et cetera. And then those are debated, those are taken in and out, and the reps will find out which of their earmarks or amendments are approved until we vote the final budget. Then we send it off to the Senate, as the Senator said, and they do their show as well with their amendments. 
And then it goes to a six-member conference committee, three reps, three senators. Sometimes it takes a little longer than to, when it's due. And uh, then it goes to the governor for either her signature or a veto or what have you. Okay? So the numbers you're seeing now may not be the final numbers, um, but what will it increase in Marlin? I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure yet. At the very best, what the, the state has done through the amendment process is we go from $30 a student to 60. That won't help Marlin because you're getting the 90. So unless we went to $120 a student, you'll get the extra 30. But right now we're at the 90, as the senator said. So we'll probably get to it $60 per child, but that will only affect those who get very minimal, which is $30 per student times the number of students who had October 1st. Okay. Um, thank you, Rep. Altrino. And I think this is a, a really great strategy. Um, the delegations worked very hard um, to kind of come up with what these strategies would be, which ones are the most feasible, you know, again, what amount of money. There's a lot of thought that's gone into this, again, and uh, they're working very closely with the mayor and his team, Ron Hogan especially. Um, so I applaud the efforts of our House delegation to put forward a range of, of proposals. Um, just to be clear, the numbers you're seeing in that column are not the amounts Malden would receive, right? That's the total amount that would then be, if we're, if, if we're successful in the final budget, that would be distributed across however many municipalities would qualify based on the pothole account or the other things. So depending on what happens in the House budget, I will then pick it up from there. So um, you know, if, if, if several of these strategies are not accepted into the House budget, I'll take a run at them on the Senate side. So we'll have another shot, basically another bite at the apple. Um, you know, we'll do the best we can. We'll see what potentially can make it into the, you know, the final budget that the governor will, will sign. Our, you know, our first uh, priority is to try to increase funding for Malden in the fiscal year 25 budget. That's obviously the top priority. The second priority is to try to uh, do something to at least reform this part of the, the Chapter 70 formula so that you know, this won't continue to uh, uh, impact the city in, in, the, in the way that it currently is. Okay, all right, we're almost done. Um, so basically this is just a summary of as sort of what we've said already. We've been, been at this for you know, several years now. Um, mentioned the work we've also in included, Salem Mayor, now Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll, so that's great to have her as, a, as, a, as an ally. I've looped in some of my other Senate colleagues on this, like Senator Lovely from Salem. Um, and again, as Rep. Altrino said, we have advocated with the Education Secretary, Pat Tutwiler, for over a year now for him to take the lead in pulling together the working group that we need to build a consensus here. Um, but unfortunately, the administration has been re uh, resisted and reluctant to do so to date. Um, we had a very significant meeting with uh, the Assistant Secretary, Tom Moreau. Uh, you can see who joined us at that meeting. The entire delegation participated. And um, so we have, suffice it to say, we've made it very, very clear to, uh, from the governor, to the lieutenant governor, to the secretary, and to the DESE commissioner and staff, you know, what's going on here, what the issue is we're concerned about, how it's impacting Malden, Salem, and some other communities, and really advocating you know, to, uh, to address it. Um, so basically going forward from where we are today, you know, again, we're going to pursue multiple near-term strategies uh, in the fiscal year 25 budget with the goal of trying to increase funding for Malden either directly through the Chapter 70 formula, so more than that $600,000 increase, or if we can do it through some other mechanism like a pothole account, you know, whatever we are able to do. And, uh, and then we'll continue to look for longer-term strategies um, to you know, make these necessary reforms to the, to the Chapter 70 formula. So I believe that's it. Yep, we just had to, if there was a few appendix slides if we need them, but basically that's the uh, end of the presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, thank you very much. I don't know if Rep Donato or, or Rep Lipper Garabedian um, want to say something? Uh, no, I think it's going to right. be Okay. Just to reiterate, the delegation has worked assiduously to get the matters of the problems that Malden has in front of the secretary, in front of the uh, 
uh, Chairman of Ways and Means, and uh, in my discussions with uh, um, uh, my leadership role with uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, indicating that uh, there's many ways that we can uh, uh, attack this problem. Um, as uh, pointed out, it's either going to be five communities that can benefit with a certain amount of money, or 217 uh, communities, or all of the communities, depending upon the amount of money that uh, uh, we can uh, put forward. So we will be continuing to uh, have those discussions in the next three days before the uh, uh, final budget comes out. Right. Thank you, Representative. <clears throat> Great. And I, I don't know, can we see uh, Representative? I, I saw she was there, but she was moved, so. I'll just re I thank you all for having us, and I've been uh, really honored to work with the full Malden delegation, including, um, you know, Vice Chair Altrino and Chair Lewis in, from the education space and Leader Donato. Um, as you all know, I come from the education secretariat um, and so was uh, involved in um, reviewing and helping to implement the Student Opportunity Act as well. So um, I'm just pleased to be working so diligently with them, as well as um, many members of the mayor's administration um, as well. So happy to be here. All right. Thank you, Representative. And then I have uh, Councilor Spadafore. Um, you're first up here. If you have thank you. Thank you, members of the delegation. I appreciate it. This is going to be a general question, uh, but more, I think, for the education of the audience. See, we do have a lot of, looks like, mass educators. I'm going to go through this, and I'm sure the state delegate has okay. seen this. I'm going to throw out some facts because I think we all agree that the formula is broken for Malden. The state delegate has been very nice to tell us, I think, hopefully we got a, we got a moonshot, hopefully 24, right, 25 budget. We get, some, so we get the portal account, some options. If not, then I think we got to look at a longer term issue. But we all agree that, fund, that formula for Malden is broken. And, um, you know, Ron Hogan, who works in the mayor's office, he came down and gave this presentation, I would say, two and a half years ago, warning us of this demise. And I, I just want to throw some facts out here because there was a lot of great numbers up there, but I want to show how it affects Malden. In the net school formula, Senator Lewis was absolutely right, and so was uh, Council, excuse me, Rep. Trino. Um, it, takes, it takes a lot of understanding how to do it, um, but basically there's a required net school spending, and I'm cheating, and there's a required contribution, and there's a target contribution. And what happens is you use the income and the tax revenue of the assessed value of the property. So the more residential we're adding right now, and my colleagues are probably going to laugh when I say this, the more residential property we, we actually bring in hurts us in this formula. I'm not saying it's bad for the community. I'm saying it's bad for this formula the way it's written right now. Commercial, which we don't have a lot of, in which Boston is going through the same challenge right now, they're shifting their tax base to the commercial because there's no income tied to a commercial spot and there's no hit to the school budget because nobody lives in a piece of commercial property. Just to set the record straight how we're going to work here. So, Malden right now, in terms of gateway cities, I don't know if we fall at the top or the bottom. I don't know how we look at this. The average gateway community right now required local aid as a percentage of available revenue. The average is 24.37% 7, of the budget. The target local contribution of available revenue on the average is 29.98. Malden is 35.76, and the target available revenue is 43.82. Peabody's next. So we're the, we are the worst on that list. So when you say, target, when you say average gateway, average gateway, we are, we are the worst based on the school spending formula now. Put into perspective right now, Lawrence is getting required funds per capita of $1,395 with a target local remaining of $1,060. Malden's getting $1,418. Target remote is $1,240. I'm going to tell you what Everett is. Everett gets $2,553, $2,469 per capita. Simply put, and I can share this deck, it's public. If Malden simply had the average of all the gateway cities which I gave you, the leftover, we would have $30 million more. 
So why it's important for this audience to understand the problem with this, this funding is, as this number goes up, we contribute more to the school budget. We contribute less to every other line item on the budget. It's math. It's not policy. It's not politics. It's math. So I'm glad the delegation's here because we have to fix this because we also now have the state telling us we have a mandate to put in MBTA community housing, not affordable, which if we don't fix this, I'll tell you what the code is. The code is local share. That means we're going to tax everybody. So we want more to be affordable, but we're going to increase the taxes. Simply put, we don't fix this formula as a, as a group, as a community, as a team. There's left revenue for everybody else, and there'll either be a Proposition 2 and a half override, or will, there will be cuts. Simple as that. So I would be happy to share this deck. Ron Hogan gave this deck out three weeks ago. Uh, I will tell you, as a council of 20 years and pretty good with finance, this scares me because not only is it aid, it's people's jobs. And I live here. My kids go to school here. Thank God I have a good job. But there's people in this, 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 the numbers here that don't have those options. And I'm frightened, not only the, the state of the state, but if we don't get this fixed. So I'm praying as a good Catholic, that the contingency can do something this year, if not next year, because the last thing I will say is we talk about inflation. The first number we got from our health insurance provider this year was an average increase of 18.5%. That's inflation, which would equate to $4.2 million to pay for health insurance. It's pretty tough to raise taxes when you only 2.5% and $4.2 million is going to go to health insurance. That's all I had. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hey, could I just add for... something? Okay, go ahead. Uh, go go ahead. Okay? Yep. Yeah. Sure. No, just wanted to thank uh, Councilor Spadafora for sharing those. And, you know, a lot of that data and the presentation comes from Ron Hogan, you know, who has shared them with us. And we sat down. In fact, we presented a lot of those numbers to Associate Commissioner Tom Moreau. And, you know, a lot of Ron Hogan's calculations are basically showing what Malden's required local contribution to its schools is as a percent of its available revenues or net revenues, different measures of revenue. So it is important to also acknowledge, and I know this is maybe not a popular view, but a lot of what's driving this as well is the fact that the city's um, tax rate and the taxes it collects are far lower than comparable uh, communities. So that's a big piece of this. Part of it is, yes, the, that formula is calling for the city to contribute more than we might say is fair. But a big piece of this also is when you do these comparisons to Everett and Haverhill and Methuen and, and Revere and other communities is that comparably situated communities, the tax burden in those communities is higher and in some cases much higher than, than it is in Malden. I know that's not an easy problem to solve and I don't, I don't envy you having to address that but we should just also on it, be honest about what's going on here. Um, I, I know Councillor McDonald, I guess he has his hand raised. Councillor McDonald, do you want to um, go ahead and speak? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Council President Winslow, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, thank you. But I, I really do want to uh, thank Senator Lewis and Rep. Trino uh, for taking the lead on this, but our whole delegation on what I think is a really, I'm hopeful, um, even if, uh, you know, we hope for the best and prepare for the worst, um, that we'll get some relief. Uh, in this budget from these strategies that you've put out here. Um, and I wanted to just share my perspective as chair of the finance committee, just a little bit about how I think about this and 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 highlight what I think, um, what the real problem is here for folks who I think are, uh, you know, maybe trying to follow the different pieces of this. And then I want to ask, you know, a, a bigger picture question. Because I think that we are all committed to doing what it takes to fund our schools for our students our um, and our basic city services. And yes, we have gotten more revenue from the state for that. We're very, you know, very grateful for that. But with a new teacher contract in place, um, I actually have a lot of faith that our school, um, our school leadership will invest the money that they do have wisely. And we need to live up to that to those contract commitments. So we're all trying to head in the same place. 
We're trying to support that as the city council, the school committee, the state is all trying to direct enough funding to our education, but we all have different speed limits and tools that we are working with. And that means that there are these set of assumptions that that we've explained here about how what how those speed limits and how those tools operate. And as we've shown here, Malden's uh, Malden speed limit doesn't really uh, pass the sniff test in terms of what we're able to do. Um, I think folks know that the speed limit for local revenues is two and a half percent plus uh, whatever new gets built. Um, and so that's that was about three percent of our property taxes last year. And uh, and our school are required, you know, our required part of the puzzle here for Chapter 70 is going up a, a little over six, almost six and a half percent uh, this year. That's the mismatch of those um of those uh, those speed limits and those expectations, and um, and I appreciate that uh, you know when you look at the aggregate, the state might say, well, maybe Malden should raise its taxes. Um, I certainly think, as Councillor Spatafora said, that we are heading towards a towards a choice of whether our community wants to do that or have some pretty serious cuts. But I will just say, you know, you can go and download every override that's passed in the history of Massachusetts since Prop Two and a Half was law, and there are only two communities that have ever passed overrides that get into the neighborhood of 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 what Malden's real ultimate target is going to be, which is about twelve million dollars from where we are right now, and that's Winchester and Newton that have passed over ten million dollar overrides. So I, you know, to imagine the override solution being able to get us as far as we need to go to just maintain current levels of city staffing above that um, is hard to fathom. And I will also just note that I think the, uh, you know, some folks may look at this and say, well, why, if we're spending too much on the schools to be able to fund our library and our firefighters and our parks and everything else, why don't we just cut the schools? Let me just be clear. That's not what I'm advocating for, but I want to explicitly note to folks uh, that we cannot, the state does not allow us to cut our schools with a, our school spending without having other penalties. This is required. It is that important. The state believes it to be that important. And yet we do not have any additional tools uh, beyond the ones that we have and this level of, you know, pressure from the state to do this. Um, one final point I just want to make about our development, and, and I'll respectfully disagree with my colleague um, about the impact of building, you know, new new housing or new commercial development in the city. We are so far over uh, the expectations that the state has for us that I don't think new growth will make a lot of difference. And it only makes a lot of difference if we're doing it alone, uh, because as we've noted, this formula looks at the state as a whole. And so our uh, the nature of this MBTA communities law is that everybody's doing, you know, the majority of places in the Commonwealth will have to comply with this law. And so that will though that will somewhat cancel each other out, I think, in the long run in the formula. So I actually don't expect the level of impact due to that. So my question um, is that, you know, even in the best case scenario where one or more of these um, shorter term fixes passes, we still have a long term problem, which is that we really don't uh, know how we're going to get to a, a reasonable expectation of what local municipalities can pay. And places like Malden feel it the worst because we have such a high need population here. That's what being a gateway city is all about. And with the equity you know, commitments that are woven into this formula, uh, I, I'd like to know from our state delegation, what do you think a fair ultimate resolution that you could support would look like for this formula that would in fact finally get us to a reasonable expectation for local contribution? Thank you, Councilor McDonald. Yep, that's a lot of um, good, um, good analysis and good, good thoughts there. And I know you've worked, you know, very hard on this for also for a very long time. So, um, you know, look, I don't think there's there's obviously not a silver bullet here. There, you know, there's a variety of factors at play here. There's there is the, the school funding formula. There is general municipal finance, and you know, overall dealing with the proposition two and a half that was. Uh, adopted by voters in Massachusetts in 1980 and how we deal and live within those means. Um, so there's no simple answer. There's no one solution. I think it's going to be a combination of things that we do. Uh, I think hopefully 
making changes to the way the formula determines local contribution, and that would ease some of the pressure on Malden and similarly situated communities. But there's still going to be the need to increase funding for the schools. You know, the, the need is there. That's why the foundation budget's increasing. That's because the need is there. And uh, so there's still going to be a need for more money to go to the schools. And again, I'm not saying they shouldn't be going to public safety and senior services and other things. We're just talking schools tonight. Um, so I think this, you know, making some of those changes to the formula will require the state to, uh, you know, again, to offset those with increased state aid. So that, that's part of it. Um, and then part of this needs to be solutions at the municipal level. And um, I can't tell you how to do your business or what, what tools you're going to use. But um, I, again, I just think big picture, there's not one single way to address this. It's going to take multiple strategies, state and municipal level, uh, to probably get there. And just, okay. Thank you, Senator. And just to um, continue with what Council McDonald was saying, if we look at the formula, and that's why we have to continue to study it, because if we tweak any part of the formula, will it hurt us on the poverty calculation, or will it hurt us on some other part of the SOA calculation that we're doing? And will it help enough cities and towns to get a legislature of 200 representatives and senators to pass it? Because again, you know, I'd be lying to you to say if it just helps Malden and Medford and Melrose, and Lit but it doesn't help the rural communities or the seacoast communities, whatever, it's going to be a tough thing to pass in the legislature, just as it is when you count your votes to pass something you're doing. So we have to be very careful when we, that's why it took 10 plus years just to look at student opportunities and say, you're never going to have a perfect formula. The thing I don't like about comparing to other cities and towns is you don't know the students in the other cities and towns. I don't care what the spreadsheet says. You don't know how many kids are living in poverty, which we rate. You don't know how many uh, children require certain services. You don't know the tax rates of some of those cities and towns. So I think you should look at that uh, and question yourself, well, what do those cities and towns look like? Uh, you have someone like Everett, who has more poverty, and probably the property values aren't as high as they are in Malden. Where Everett's saving graces, they do economic development. They have Encore. They have a lot of land to develop, maybe build a soccer stadium down the road or another hotel or something. They are fortunate enough that they're doing economic development through their city with the help of the state, of course, as Malden has been helped, uh, to bring in additional revenue. Um, so I, I caution, you know, yes, there's a problem with the formula for Malden. But if we try and test a new formula, where does it hit other cities and towns where we need the votes for? Or will it hurt Malden in some other way? All right? And then you look at the revenue from the state. And I don't see much more money coming from the feds to help the state out, uh, as you can see in some issues we're having now where we're left to pay everything. Um, it has to come from somewhere. And that's where we're working hard to make sure our revenues also pay all the bills that the state's doing. So there is a problem with the formula. It needs to be changed. The key is, when we change it, how does it affect? And how do we help Malden even more? So, and all the reps are going to be asking, how does it help my community? Just like you do in your ward. Because I was a ward counselor. How does this help my ward? Thank you. Uh, Councilor Simonelli? Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, look, I, you know, I just want to say that um, I want to thank the state delegation for coming here tonight with a, um, with a presentation uh, that was uh, very helpful in explaining uh, the situation, how we got here, and, and, and what we're going to be doing to get ourselves out of here. It looks like a multi-pronged approach. Uh, for many different avenues, including the city side, along with the state delegation, on making up the difference. But you know, I, I'm looking at this here over at the. Um, I'm looking at uh, you know for for the aid here for for Malden is get twelve twelve million six hundred eight thousand, and then Everett has forty two eight hundred and sixty seven thousand million. million. I'm sorry, million forty two million eight hundred sixty seven thousand. That they're getting, so that's a quite that's quite of a difference between the two that the state is giving to Everett compared to Malden. And if you look at the, um, I have it here for the, uh, thank you, sir. 
And if you if thanks, buddy. And if you're looking at, you know, the, the number of students, you know, Malden has uh, six thousand eight hundred three, and then Everett has seven thousand four hundred thirty-seven. That's not a real big number, but there is a big number in in revenue that the city of Everett's getting from the state. So Why is that? Just to be clear, Malden's getting $63 million. So I don't know if that's the number you said. S that's, $63 million. That's the total amount of Chapter 70. Right? So Compared I don't to know what Everett's number is this year. It may be more than that, but, but, it, but Malden's 63. So it's, it, you know, it, the whole idea of the Chapter Thanks. 70 formula is not to give every community the same amount per pupil. Right? That would be an easy way to do this and say, what well, we're going to give everyone $1,000 per student or two, whatever, but that wouldn't be equitable, right? Because the need is not the same, right? And the ability to, to, to fund public schools is very different in, in cities and towns depending on, the, on their local uh, property values and wealth. So the whole idea is not to give the same amount per student, per student. That's the whole point of the formula is to calculate how much does that community need how much can they contribute? And then the state picks up the difference. Um, you know, as, as Rep. Altrino was saying, Everett has some similarities to Malden, but it's not the same. They have a higher poverty rate. Um, they are in a higher low-income group than, than Malden is, which impacts the foundation budget calculations. Um, I believe they have a higher percentage of English learner students than Malden does. That's very true, in, obviously, in Chelsea. Um, and it all depends who you compare yourself to. Malden gets a lot more money than Salem does. Salem has a very similar right. number of low-income students and lots of English learners. Malden gets way more. Malden gets way more money than Medford does. You know? Yeah. No, that's because Medford does have more resources. And, you know, that's a, there's a reason for that. I'm not, these are not arbitrary things. There's a reason behind them. Doesn't always seem on the surface, maybe, but there are reasons. And it all depends when you make these comparisons. That's why I would agree with Rep. Altrina. I caution trying to compare to this community or that because all depends who you want, who you compare yourself so all, to. So all of these, all of these things are factored into the amount of money that Everett's yep, getting compared to what yep, Malden's correct. getting. And That's right. It's, it's all, and it's not decision by any reps or right. senators. We have no role in this. That's why this formula was created in 1993. So, takes any politics out of this. This is just data goes in a in a spreadsheet. The Department of Education runs that every year, and it spits out these numbers uh, for every community. Well, I appreciate that, and you know I, I get it. I get that it can seem on the surface like sure. why is this? You know, it just yeah. doesn't seem fair. That's our jobs up here, right? To yep. see why this one's getting that, and this, yep. and we're not, right? We want to make sure no, that totally you know we get our lion's share of funding, right? Yep. So, but I, again, I, I do want to thank you guys for coming in here tonight and explaining this to us. And you know, I have all the faith in the world in you, gentlemen, and everybody that's working with us to make sure that this matter gets resolved. I know it's a scary situation for us up here, and you know, since I've been back on the council, uh, this, is, this topic has been coming up quite a bit. So it, you know, it's getting to a point where you're very concerned about it and where we're gonna be in the future. But I, again, I do have uh, all the faith in the world in you guys, and you know, I know you're doing a good job up there, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Just to, uh, two things is, um, if you wanna compare districts, we, under Senator Lewis's version of the Student Opportunity Act that he pushed, we added another group of funding for those that are low income up to 12, group 12 now, and Malden can fit into 11 or even drop to 10, depending on um, the number of children in poverty. Everett is a group higher than us at this point. That's why they get more money. But I'll give you a good example. There's an amendment going to be filed by my uh, friend in Pittsfield, and she dropped a group because of three students that left poverty. And the reason they left poverty is the federal government is asking us to recalculate those that are eligible for mass health because they, they froze it during the income during COVID. Malden was one of the 19 cities and towns that we, people went door to door to get you to refile on mass health. You probably got calls on that. Three of those students who got moved out of poverty, which cost probably a million dollars or so for that city and town because they changed the group was because of not those three children's families made any more money. They just did not qualify for the new federal standard of mass health, huh. which is one of the calculations huh. of determining if a child is in poverty, just like student lunch used to be and stuff like that. And these numbers are driven by the school system. And again, you know, the thing is, we go by an October 1st deadline. 
But children come and go. Ask a, ask a school teacher in here. You know, the, every day you could have a different child. One could have more poverty than another. One could maybe cost the district 200000 if we have to put them in an outplacement. Right. We don't know. Right. Um, so that's the problem with a formula. So she looked at my amendment. She said, that's nice, but would you sponsor my amendment changing the calculation of poverty? Well, does it help Malden? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> you know, I don't right. want to do anything that changes our calculus. It's funny. Whatever it does get more because of that area, Revere. Right. And, well. and you're right, Pittsfield is in some trouble up there. They've yeah, got and, some and, issues. I've been dealing with students, the mayor up there. Yeah. But by three students, she lost that amount of money. And it wasn't because they bring in more money. It's because the federal government had us change right. the um, calculation for right. those that qualify for mass health. So you want to change that part of the formula, then what, what, right. what is it? It's affect? a domino effect that either any way that you right. change this. I got it. All right. Okay. Thank you, thank Councilor you. Simonelli. Thank you, um, guys. Councilor Colon Hayes. Thank you. Uh, so I want to say thank you um, for coming here and giving us this presentation. Thank everyone here, actually, more importantly, for showing up. Um, please continue to show up because it's going to take all of us to, to get this done. Um, so, yeah, it was not um, a surprise um, what we heard. We've been hearing this. Um, and I've only been on the council for a few years, but we've been hearing this for a very long time. Um, so basically, I'm there was a tremendous amount of information to absorb here tonight. <laughs> so I'm trying to absorb it. I was frantically taking notes, taking pictures of it here. But I've also called you, each of you, and um, you graciously took a lot of time to talk things through with me. Um, I've also called the superintendent's office and um, the finance chairs for um, both the school committee and the city council because I truly believe that we should be working together on this. Um, I think it's going to take all hands on deck. Uh, I don't want to, this formula we all know is not going to change. I mean, this, I mean, for a while, I, mean, I have trust and faith that you're working so hard to do it, but this is going to take years and there's so much involved and I really appreciate you bringing up the mental health funding and um, the food and, and feeding our kids and these, especially as a social worker and someone who works out in the field and hears that from our constituents every day, we cannot lose that either, right? So um, th this, I think what it's gonna take now is working to see what we have been doing. I wanna know exactly what we have been doing to prepare for this since we've known about it for, um, for years in our city. That has nothing to do with you, but that's what I'm gonna be looking into um, and looking at what are we spending? What are we spending on? Um, you know, how are we spending it? How can we do better? And so these are the things that I think um, all of us that are here need to do um, to, to work on things together because that's really the only way that we're gonna come through this. So I hope that um, we get together with each other and, and bang out some like um, out of the box ideas, right? Because um, we'll all be looking, you should all be looking. Um, and so thank you again for coming. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilor Colon Hayes. Um, uh, Councilor O'Malley, you, uh, you're up next. Please unmute yourself. Uh, Councilor O'Malley, did you want to speak? All right, we can go to Councilor Linehan then. We'll, Councilor O'Malley, put your hand up again if you'd like to speak. May I interrupt just one second, Mr. Sure. Uh, President? Uh, yeah. <coughs> Councilor Hayes has a good point. You've been trying to take notes. We also have some graphs that go along with these. Uh, my uh, aide Lizzie will send it to Ms. Cagno, and uh, she can disseminate it to all of you. But sometimes visual mm. stuff might be easier as well. So she put that together. We, I think we sent it to the mayor a while ago. Um, but we'll have that sent out tomorrow to uh, Ms. Cagno. And obviously this whole presentation tonight is, is available to you. And again, a reminder, a plug for the, the workshop that, that my office did last week. We recorded that. Just send us an email or a message, text message, and we'll, we'll get you the link to that. That, that answered one of my questions, which was how do we rewatch that, which I registered for but was unable to attend myself. Um, well, just a tremendous thanks. I think it's very valuable for the community to not only hear this, but do it on a night when we're on TV. There will be a YouTube recording. Folks can go back and watch it. It's it's so much information to absorb. I mean, I feel pretty well steeped in this, and there were still things that I was taking notes, taking pictures. I'm going to have to go reread. I'm sure I'll have follow-up questions. The two things that I'm wondering right now um, is sort of like, what is the, the state timeline for your budget is a little different from ours, correct? And I'm wondering if you can kind of touch on, like, if we're going to get into a situation where this is these amendments are maybe still working their way through when we're at our 
deadline of June 30th to have a, a city budget. Um, and then the second half of that is kind of what are the advocacy levers that people should use to be in touch if it's with ways and means, if like everybody in this room agrees on the problem and that what we want to do to solve it. So if people listening call us, like we're just going to say, yes, we agree. Is there something more that folks can do in terms of emailing, you know, members of this committee? Like what are the action items that people can do that would be helpful? Take the first part? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first step was when the governor filed her budget, right? So that was step one. Tomorrow, big step, hmm. House Ways and Means Committee releases their proposed budget. So that'll tell us a lot, you know, what is in their budget, what's not in there. Yeah. Um, then next step is the House uh, delegation is pursuing those different amendments. We'll know if you're successful when the debate wraps up, which is the basically the end of April or whatever that week yeah, is. The last 24. 24th. So we'll know by April 24th okay. what, if anything, we've been, you know, successful is in the House budget. Again, we won't know to what's in the Senate budget until late May. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, if something is in either the House or Senate budget, it's not a guarantee it makes it in the final budget, but we'll have a fairly good high level of confidence. So we'll be able to certainly give more guidance to okay. you all and, and the mayor and, and you know, the team. Um, but it is true we won't know the final budget probably at, at earliest end of June, early July. Okay, that's but again, helpful. again, we'll be able to give you a lot of guidance even after tomorrow and then certainly after the House finishes its budget and the Senate does so, which again is late April and late May. Okay. And just to clarify, the amendments that Rep. Donato, myself, and Lipper Garabinian uh, put together, I, we presented them on three different occasions on our individual meetings to put it in the budget so I'll find out tomorrow if right. that's the key, um, you know. Um, and then if that's not in that general budget, then that's when the amendment process will go. The conference committee is a very interesting. As I said, it's three members of the House, three members of the Senate. And they go at it, yep. and it's private, actually, and we can only vote it up or down. We can't amend a conference committee report. Unfortunately, over the last few years, uh, we've gone beyond, and we've had to do a 112 budget and stuff. But we generally have an idea, as the senator said, if it's something like an earmark or something, generally we, they keep those. These are like policy changes that we put in the budget. Yeah. Budget is a very big policy document uh, that the House and Senate will go back and forth on. And usually the, the governor uh, would add something. She has 10 days to either veto or what have you. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a decent idea by the time, but it does put you on a tough timeline. I'm yeah. not. I'm not going to, it puts nonprofits on a tough timeline. It's like, am I getting this grant or not? Right. I don't know. Well, we'll, um, but the conference committee report will do the final say. But the good thing is, whatever I can't get, or Donato or Libra Garabini can get, I call Jason right <laughs> away and says, okay, and he can file his. Right, and okay. there's 40 of them, 160 of us, you know, and, and that's when we try to go back and forth. But I, I understand it's going to put you in a very tight timeline. Uh, to get your June 30th deadline out. So, yeah, you know. and I don't, what I don't want to have happen is folks starting to say, well, there's going to be cuts, right, in the schools that take place immediately, and I know that people are making their plans for the jobs that they're going to have right. in the fall, and we are, have a lot of open positions as it is, so it does, it's just going to be a little bit sticky, I think. Right. And the, uh, the oh. second part about just how to advocate effectively. Well, you know, advocate effectively, I've heard from many of you. I've heard from many constituents. Today there was a big rally on the governor's proposal to cut uh, some services for uh, the, uh, individuals who are disabled. We've had mm. multiple meetings uh, because not everyone's happy with an organization being cut or a line item being cut. Um, so you could imagine that's more important to them than Chapter 70, as right. you could imagine. Um, so advocating, you know, give our office a call. I always let... Uh, our chair know, you know, how many calls. We track every call that okay. comes in. My, my staff does. We have casework. There are thousands, whether you call for the registry of motor vehicles or you're calling to advocate for a bill 1234. Okay. Um, you can do it that way. Um, and that's probably your best way. Through organizations as well, Mass Association of School Superintendents, Mass Association of School Committees, Mass Teachers Association, American Federation of Teachers. Those are the ones that also have... Um, 
good lobbying efforts to okay. the speaker who finally mm -hmm. makes the final decision what's going to be in that budget. Uh, back to Councillor Spadafora and Simonelli, when you compare districts, Malden gets hit in those top four. In the top 12 districts that get hit hurt more, too, from this formula, the speaker's district. Mm. He's in like Quincy, Quincy is one right. of those districts uh, under the top 12 that gets hurt from that part of the formula. So I've been- and helps us in a perfect way. Planting a seed, oh, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, this could help it. <laughs> oh, I wish I could bring more money in. Right. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. That, that does remind me, and thank you, Councilor Lennon, for the question about advocacy. You know, we talked about how to get the Student Opportunity Act passed, which updated the part of the formula that calculates foundation budget. That took like almost a decade. And you know, we had the teacher unions banging on the, on the table about that. We had the school committees, superintendents association. We had parents. You know, we had guidance counselors, social, I mean, everybody was saying, look, we're not fairly calculating what our schools need. We're under-resourcing our public schools, and, we, and, and that took all of that work. And this issue of updating the way we calculate the local contribution, we don't have that. Mm. It's one of the challenges we face. It's Malden's delegation and, and you know, and, and, and the mayor. We've tried to bring in Salem, right? That's why we worked with them. So that is true. We have an ally in the lieutenant governor, but we don't have you know, the teacher unions talking about this. We don't yeah. have the school committees talking about this. We don't have the superintendents association. We don't have the mass municipal association. All these groups mm. that have relationships and clout on Beacon Hill, right now at least, not for lack of trying, but right now this is not one of their priority issues. So part of how we, we need your help is with the connections you have in these different organizations to say, mm -hmm. hey, we're not saying don't advocate for some other things, but add this to your list, yep. you know. This is something that needs to get fi fixed, and we need you to, to advocate for it. That's really helpful. Thank you. All right. Um, Councillor O'Malley, were you uh, still w looking to talk? I think Councillor O'Malley parking. Oh, he's parking. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> I did, any, any Councillor, I don't have any other light, so I, if I would uh, speak here for myself. So, um, I do want to thank the state delegation for coming out and uh, giving us a presentation. I know this is a very busy time of year, so I know it was very important for us to um, meet with you while um, these discussions are going on and it's, it's hot on the stove. So um, I think we really much appreciate that. Councilor O'Malley is joining us in person, so thank you. So that's great, and I, I do, I, sometimes I, I know having worked on um, like the regional bike trail stuff of having enough communities work on something made a big difference over the course of time. And I, I, I give the analogy of uh, sometimes that you need enough dogs to pull that sled. Like if you only have four dogs to pull the sled, it's a lot harder sometimes than if you have 12 dogs. So it sounds like we gotta maybe try to work on something towards 12, 12 dogs and stuff like that. Can you go to the, the slide that showed um, FY18 to FY, the, the difference between what we're required to contribute and I just want a little understanding of that. So, so there's that targeted local yes. share. So that's been, that increased from 48.2% to 56.2%. But then there's the required local share. So, and that seems to be growing, you know, it grew about 3% over that time versus, you know, 8%. Yes. Uh, so now I also, so I'm just trying to understand, like one of the things I know Councillor uh, Linehan and Councillor McDonald have a paper on the uh, agenda tonight to really look at longer term because I think as Councillor Spadafore talked about, it was like, you know, we know it's hard right now at this moment, but this is not a problem that goes away even if the city can, can step up um, this fiscal year in some way. Um, this is something that's, it's, the problem just gets bigger and bigger for us. So, um, so in terms of like F, FY26, 27, 28, is that, Required local share going to increase the same way? I just is that, um, you know, what what can we, you know, is there projections so, already that that are being made or, you know, can we? I guess that we can't predict exactly because yeah. you can see it fluctuates a bit, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but basically, if we go to another slide, actually, we're going to go use our appendix. Okay. Um, so here, this doesn't go all the way back to FY18, but it goes back to FY22. So you can see. One of the things that's not helpful to Malden, to these numbers, is the enrollment hasn't really, it dipped a bit, came back a bit, dipped again, hasn't really been growing. 
two of the things that affect the, the amount of, uh, of aid that a community receives. Inflation rate, very sensitive. That affects everybody. Again, very low inflation rate this year. But another thing that has a big impact is enrollment. So when enrollment is growing fast, that drives up the foundation budget more and will generally lead to more Chapter 78. So Malden's not, unfortunately, benefiting from that because, again, enrollment's been pretty flat. You can see, notwithstanding the flat enrollment, look how much the foundation budget's been growing. See that? 97 million, 105, 117, 121. That's the Student Opportunity Act. That's what's driving up that foundation. That's the amount that the formula says Malden needs to provide a quality education to its population of students. So the formula is saying that it's $121 million is what Malden public schools need in fiscal year 25, okay? And just looking so, at that, there's, you know, the, the chapter 70 has increased 12 million over that time, yep. and then our contribution is, you know, increased by 10. Has increased so by 10. So yes. that's so it's basically very easily because the required local contribution is roughly close to 50%, now it's 47, so. it's roughly 50-50. Right? So, so essentially so, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. It, as that foundation budget goes up, the formula is saying, you know what, you Malden need to kick in about half of that, we the state will kick in about half of that. Yeah. But what I was trying to get to Councillor, uh, sorry, President Winslow, yeah. sorry to yeah, pause sure, yeah. you can see the increase on the very bottom row in the, what actually it's costing Malden is about three million a year, right? So that is another three million each year that the city is, the, is, is required to contribute to its schools that's probably likely to more or less continue at that, at that So, level. and from this, you know, so even probably. though our Chapter 78 increased, you know, 600,000 or yes. so, our local contribution Still went year up by 3 million. went up 3 million. And I guess that's the potential for FY26, if inflation stays the same and, and enrollment stays the same, we could be facing another 3 million and another 3 million and another 3 million. So that's, that's a little bit of that what we're is, trying to get at. And, uh, that, I, that is I possible, <laughs> yes. That is and possible I, I, unless this part of the formula changes that that is, because again, because Malden is so far below its target share, you see, yeah. even where we are, where the city is now at 47.5, that's still pretty far below what the formula is saying is what it, the target should be. And so that's, the formula is trying to drive the city Closer to and, that, and sort of the the median, like you said, that I mean, technically, the 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 formula, the tipping point on the formula is like what 59, 50, Are we right at the tipping point? Is that you talked about the the we there's a figure of fifty six percent has to come from the municipal budget and. 44. There, there was something in the formula that is yeah, that, saying, and that has to be. In aggregate, yes. And so, and what's happening is in part, and this is some, I'm learning something every time I come to and hear this. But you're saying essentially what's happening and, and what's pressuring Malden is that you're back when, on this when, side now. yeah, that one, that <laughs> yes. when you know the uh, you know the um, you know, education reform happened, the formula there was not so many communities at that 82.5 percent. So there's a lot of those 212 communities there contribution to the municipal park can't grow right. and then we're at the yes. other end where the formula is assuming that we can grow and that type of thing so I yes you know one of the things I think I, I today was the opening day for the Red Sox and I was thinking of there's some analogy in, in baseball and sports where you have these you know in Major League Baseball you have they have salary caps and that's a way that 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 works and I, I think the crazy thing I think it's essentially what this is like for the, from the city's point of view, you know, we have that budget that we have. Um, and this formula says, pay so much for your outfield. Um, and, and, and it's great. I really appreciate all the effort that's going in to pay the, our, for a student's education, and that's fantastic. And that's a big focus of this. And I think the challenge is that we have only so much money we're a small market team or whatever. We, we're not like the Yankees or the Dodgers that can just spend, you know, literally billions of dollars, it seems like this time, to, to get the top players. We have to compete on a level. And what's happening is, is that, you know, our outfield might thrive, but, you know, the, uh, the fire and police and DPW people who are in the infield, um, that's, you know, 
we're having problems of not being able to have it, you know, that. And if you don't, you know, the city is a team. So we need all that team to make the city work. And if we can't have a, a decent enough catcher or we can't even have a first baseman, I think that's the dilemma for us. And that's kind of the dilemma we're facing is that suddenly we don't have a team in an effective city. So that's really the, my sports analogy for today. If, if, we, if we have a great outfield but don't have the infield, we're, we're not competitive. And that's bad. I mean, we even had the me melee down the street here. Um, you know, we had to call in state aid for that. So if we don't um, have the police here and other type of things, we, and that undermines the whole thing, that if we don't have, a, you know, one of the things I talked about Malden, what's been so attractive in being a diverse community is that it, we have um, a, you know, a leading edge fire department. We have a, a great police department that it responds to the diversity here. It's a welcoming and safe community that's been affordable. And, you know, if we, our budget goes the route where we can't, maintain that safety, then the education doesn't help as much because our city's in crisis. So that's really kind of some of the dilemma that we face here. And I know, I mean, we talk about, you know, I think the other analogy I say is small market team. I mean, the Yankees, I mean, I think there's some tickets that are $2,000. You know, we're not that kind of place. And so we have only so much we can charge for tickets, otherwise our you know, audience goes down. So I think that's the dilemma, the prop two and a half thing is like, I mean, if we raise our ticket prices, we lose our people in the stands and that, that hurt, helps us, so it hurts us. So really, I mean, what is the only solution you see? I mean, is- Could you sell more hot dogs? <laughs> there's a limit on that too. I mean, see, that's the thing. There, there's only, you know, you know, some communities, you know, you, you do, even the Red Sox this year, they're having problems selling the tickets. They have $99 for some tickets and some hot dogs. Even, even they, they have to do that sometimes. You have a, have a limit when you're, you know, that. So that's, that's the type of thing and we're facing. And, you know, is what ultimately you're saying, is, is you're really asking the residents to have to do the Prop 2 and a half override when, you know, yes. people can't afford yes. to buy that, Bigger ticket. I mean, that's that's sort of the dilemma we have is that that and, and the dilemma is you know as we as a council and the mayor we are we we can't you know state law says we can't raise the ticket prices without having the, the uh, without getting the vote of the people in the stands. So that's kind of our dilemma. So is that really? I mean, ultimately we have to go to you know call the people in the stands to figure out whether we're going to have an infield or not. That's kind of what I'm getting at. So yeah. So, yeah. I'll throw one other thing into the mix, and I, and I agree. That was, t I think it was a great analogy, actually. Thank you. You know, there is also another uh, major account um, in the state budget to help municipalities, which is the unrestricted local aid, right? And that's in total about, uh, I think it's 1.3 billion, something like that. So it's mu much less than Chapter 70, but still a large amount. Uh, Malden gets a significant, you know, chunk of that. Um, I think it's 13 million, I can't remember the exact number. But that's, but that is a part, that, that doesn't have a formula. That just is what it was the year before, and then it just essentially grows uh, one, two, three percent a year. Um, there have been folks advocating, I've been one of them for a few years now, that that should also be updated to reflect need. That, you know, that, that doesn't have any bearing anymore. Maybe it did once years ago, but it doesn't have any, connection anymore to what the need is. And by need, I'm talking about non-school need. So what is the need for public safety, for senior services, library, exactly the conversation we've been having. That is something that I think you all could be advocates for. We've been trying to get the MMA, the Mass Municipal Association, to take this on. And so far, they've been reluctant because they think it's a, it's a, it's a zero-sum game. You know, if some communities were to get more additional uh, unrestricted aid, some will get less. It doesn't have to be that way. We could hold communities harmless so nobody gets less, but as we add more into that pot, it goes places where it's more needed, right? And so there are other ways to sort of, you know, come at this, um, but again, it takes yeah. working together, it takes getting, you know, and, uh, Yeah, and I do say, you board. know, excuse me, um, the, you know, Councillor Linehan's and Councillor McDonald's paper, you know, is, is looking at some, like, selling some more hot dogs, that there's mm -hmm. some things we can do, some of that. But, um, you know, raising ticket prices is not easy and there's, there's a limit on how much you can, when, when you just 
raise them enough, people just don't come to the game anymore. Yeah. And that's, that's the concern that we have. So that's really um, the thought that uh, a prop two and a half override, as, as I think Councilor McDonald pointed out, there's just a limit. We can't, you know, we can't, in, you know, Malden, we're, we can't charge, you know, Yankees prices for Malden seats or whatever. That's the type of thing that, yeah, there, there's some marginal thing we can do, but we can't increase our prices to the, the top of the market kind of thing because that's not what Malden is. So that, that's just really, we have to work on that, but I think that's just really the understanding. I think that's the type of thing we can't, we can't do that. So <coughs> O'Malley, you're here. Did you want to say something? So but I, I really want to thank you. Thank you. It, it is a tough situation for all of us, and um, let's have the conversation. We really want to figure out how to get some more dogs to pull that sled if, as, as how, however we can help with that and then you know, and, and look at that the longer term thing and uh, you know we are committed we are we I do appreciate uh, folks from our city uh, you know police fire and teachers folks coming out here to really show that you know that we're all in this together and um, that commitment and it, but you know it, it is trying to figure out you know what so we can do so but it's also the there's there's limits <laughs> to what um, we can do and, and, and you know to do that. So that's just really something. So Councilor O'Malley, thank you. I turn you on. So there you go, Councilor O'Malley. Thank you to the, to the council and the, and the public and the legislative delegation uh, for your your grace there as I um, part. Um, so I, I listened to the and was um, attentive to the entire presentation, uh, and I appreciate the the presentation that was given. Um, you know, I, I know that the Student Opportunities Act is getting us closer to what we need to spend um, on our students and education, and, and I support that. Um, one of the challenges that we, we are facing, obviously, as a commonwealth and as a city is, my understanding is revenues at the state level are, are, are lower than what was expected. Um, I just remember a couple of years ago, we, we were like living the good times where we were bringing in billions of dollars more than we, we thought we were supposed to, and returned it to taxpayers. It, I think I don't know if that necessarily was the best move at the time. Um, I don't know uh, if maybe the the deficit that we then found after was directly related to that. Um, and I just don't know where we are going in terms of uh, the revenues going forward. Uh, obviously, in Malden, our hands are tied with Prop Two and a Half. Uh, that is that was created by the legislature. That's not something that we created. Um, the Chapter 70 formula, obviously, that's something else that was created by the, the, the legislature. That's not something that we necessarily directly um, have any control over, aside from this. Um, and then, obviously, the Student Opportunities Act has exacerbated it. Um, Three million dollars additional uh, every year for the foreseeable future. That's going to ruin our community. We need to spend more on education, absolutely. Um, but a community like Malden, um, I don't think, should be on the, on the losing end of this. Um, Eventually, it, it, it's going once we go through our reserves, which you know if it doesn't happen this year or next year, it's going to be layoffs, and, and everyone needs to know that it's going to be layoffs across the board, city hall, police, fire, DPW. Um, if we don't fix this, then that's what's going to happen. Um, I don't know if furloughs are, are are something that we can do where people don't get laid off, but they they work less time and get paid less. Um, I, I really hope that we can resolve this at the state level because uh, I just don't know how uh, we can say that our tax rates are too low. Um, that has no bearing or connection between how much money we bring in every year with the levy. So my understanding is we bring in the max 2.5% that we can. Our tax rates have no bearing on that. Um, so just increasing our tax rates is not going to solve the problem. Uh, unless we pass a 25 override, which no community like ours has ever done, for general revenue at that. It might be one thing if we're talking about building new schools or building a new fire station. That's something that you might be able to get you know, community behind. But to saying that we can't balance our checkbook and we need people to pay more, no one's going to do that. So that can't be the answer. Uh, we are here to help you however we can do to advocate. If we have the governor's office on our side, we clearly have the house on our side, it sounds like we have the Senate on our side. I don't see why we can't get this done. Thank you. Any more? I don't see any light. So against uh, Senator Lewis, Rep. Oltrino, Rep. Donato, uh, Rep. Lipper-Gibini, thank you so much for advancing the ideas at the State House. Uh, we know that 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 is your role and you're doing that, and we continue to 
look forward to having the discussions and um, you know we'll let's keep the dialogue going and uh, let's let's figure out how we can work together to make the best outcome we can thank you very much and bye bye good night great great all right all right do does anybody do we want to take a two minute break all right we're going to take a short break and then we'll come back and for the next order of business thank you
Uh, next order of business. Public uh, comment. Public comment. Uh, public comment is a Um, each speaker is limited to the subject manager ma matter relevant to the evening's meeting agenda and must keep their comments to two minutes or less. Clerk, do we have anybody signed up for public comment? We have two people in person and one email that I have to read. Up first is Michelle Romero. Okay, uh, uh, Michelle Romero, please come up and speak. Thank you. All right. I know we know all you, but uh, for the record, just your name and address, Michelle. Thank you. Oh, and that's helpful too. Yes, there you go. Great. Thank you, Michelle Romero, city planner for 22 years, Malden resident for 29 years, 34 Greystone Road. For more than two decades, I've had the privilege to work with Charles Chuck Ioven and the planning board. Mr. Ioven and I do not always agree. However, I have always had the utmost respect for his professionalism character, leadership, and dedicated service to our city. The council's failure to confirm Mr. Iovan's reappointment is not justified by any legitimate reason or verifiable facts. At all meetings where you discuss confirmation of Mr. Iovan's reappointment, certain city councils presented inaccurate and misleading information. This is extremely concerning, and I speak in support of Mr. Iovan and the planning board, and to clarify for the record, Repeatedly and unanimously, the planning board members have elected Mr. Iovan as vice chair and chair. Mr. Iovan leads the board with integrity and he advances no political or personal agendas, which in this day and age is bold leadership. In each decision, Mr. Iovan, like every other board member, casts only one vote. As chair, Mr. Iovan votes last, and not only is there typically consensus of the board, most decisions are unanimously agreed upon by all nine members. There is no factual basis for the alleged lack of turnover or opportunities to serve on the planning board. Since the board was established, more than 100 Maldonians have served as members, including the dozens of individuals with whom Mr. Iovan has served. The so-called missed housing opportunities being attributed to Mr. Iovan in the planning board simply do not exist. Of the hundreds of petitions over the last two decades, the board has denied only two major residential proposals. In both cases, after hearing unprecedented opposition from numerous city councilors, other city officials and residents, and after finding the projects may cause substantial detrimental impacts to neighborhood schools and traffic. Recently, the planning board, chaired by Mr. Iovan, unanimously recommended adoption of Malden's MBTA Community Zoning Ordinance, which has the potential to create 2,265 new residential units. Any lack of understanding of the role of the planning board to change or create policy through zoning amendments is inappropriate to ascribe to Mr. Iovan and the planning board. The city council is the only body authorized to amend city zoning ordinances. The planning board is required to review proposed zoning changes, considering substantive planning objectives, community need, and general welfare. The planning board's recommendations are advisory, non-binding, and not required, however, the board still always makes recommendations regarding zoning amendments. The city council routinely disregards the recommendations of the planning board. The planning board is statutorily authorized to make and update the master plan and will work with the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development to do so. Please see the April 4th, 2024 memorandum from Deborah Burke, director of OSPCD. I will submit a copy of this comment in writing for the record. I will email it to the city clerk, and I thank you for your consideration of these comments. All right. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. All right. All right. Next uh, person we have. All right. Uh, she want, let's read the email first, then. So. My name is Ty Lamb, and I am the secretary of Bike to the Sea. I live at 223 Oliver Street, Malden. For file 160-24 in the City Council meeting on April 9th, 2024, I am writing in favor of transferring the parcel of land from Hoff's Bakery to the City of Malden. This is because the parcel will continue to be used for further plans for the bike kitchen, which is being run by Bike to the Sea. The bike kitchen is two shipping containers that will loosely enclose a future site in Malden as a social gathering place. The gray container has many bike tools, relatively cheap, consumable bike items, primarily bike lines, I'm sorry, primary bike lines, brake housing, and tire tubes. 
Users of the bike kitchen are encouraged to donate for these consumable items and will be guided on how to do minor bike fixes from bike kitchen staff volunteers in a safe and educational DIY space. Last week on Friday, April 5th, the bike kitchen had its grand opening ceremony. About 50 people showed up and surprisingly at a glance, the majority of supporters who came out on that Friday morning were avid bikers and trail users, including the BU Cycle Kitchen or Buck for short. On the following day, April, Saturday, April 6th, the bike kitchen opened for its first day of operations. Despite the drizzling rain, many curious people wanted to know more or even planned on coming back during our open shop hours on Wednesday, 6 to 9 p.m. or Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. There are already people who want to know more. Transferring ownership of this parcel would ensure that the bike kitchen will be a new, vibrant social and gathering place in Malden. Please expedite this decision and thank you for your time. All right. Uh, next comment, commenter. We have uh, Bruce, Bruce Friedman. Friedman. Please come and state your name and address for the record. And you have two minutes for your comments. Thank you. Uh, let me see again. Yeah, it's back on. Thank you, Friedman. Hi, my name is Bruce Friedman. I live at 8 Marvin Street. I run Open Commonwealth, and I think most of you know me, and I know most of you in my family. I had prepared notes for tonight, but I think uh, what I observed earlier tonight pretty much says everything. This community has had a good run economically, and we are seeing the budget tighten up. And it's funny that we talk about extremes, the extreme of asking the state delegation to fix our problem and throw more money at the solution, or the extreme of laying people off. I counter that there is a problem in the city with the way we spend money and the way we spend our resources, and this city council is out of touch with that. I was recently reviewing the employee handbook for the city of Malden. The city of Malden's base pay is based on a 35 hour work week. How many of you are working 35 hours? How many of our fire department personnel are working 35 hours a week? How many of our teachers are working 35 hours a week? It is incumbent upon you and this city to start looking at the efficiencies. Council President, you were just talking about the analogy of sports, what about money ball analogy? How about we start looking at the data and we start looking at how we're spending our money and where those efficiencies should be? What about the liabilities that the city currently stands in line of that it's unaware of? How many of the city councilors that I spoke to are aware of our current legal situation and the money that's being spent on litigation by this city? There are a bunch of lawsuits where the city stands alone, should be standing next to a, an insurance company that filed an, a, an appearance in these cases. The city solicitor's office is the only people who filed appearances in these cases, like we are uninsured. What is going on? This council needs to make itself aware of the business of the city and needs to be intimately involved with how we are spending our money. And until you guys do that and come together and demand that this is what happens with all of the departments, including the mayor's office, we are going to continue to see this struggle happen. You guys need to get a wrap on what's happening here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Friedman. All right. Um, that being the end of public comment, uh, next order of business is the consent agenda. All right. Um, this evening's consent agenda consists of meeting minutes of March 26 to be approved, one appointment to be referred to the personnel committee, five petitions to be referred to the license. Does any councilor have a desire to remove any of these items from the consent agenda for uh, further discussion? All right. Hearing no objection to the consent agenda, um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion by Councilor Sika, second by Councilor Simonelli. Clerk will call the roll. Councilor Colon Hayes. Yes. Councilor Condon. Yes. Councilor Crow. Yes. Councilor Linehan. Yes. Councilor McDonald. Yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor Sika. Yes. Councilor Simonelli. Yes. Councilor Spedafora. Yes. Councilor Taylor. Yes. Councilor President Winslow. Councilor President Winslow, yes. The consent agenda approved. Next order of business. The next order of business we have is a piece of old business that was put on the agenda under appointments and elections, paper 15, I'm sorry, 50-24 mayoral reappointment, Charles Iovan, 42 Appleton Street, Malden, as a member of the planning board, having served since November 12, 1985, said term to expire March 1st, 2028, 
to commence upon confirmation by the City Council. So, and I, I just have a, um, a statement related to this piece of old business. Um, uh, my fellow councillors, uh, you can see that paper 50-24 related to the appointment of Charles I. Oven remains on our docket as unfinished business under the appointments and elections section. I have sought the advice of our city solicitor and city clerk, and I have determined that placing the paper on the docket in this manner respects the city charter, city ordinances, council rules, and the actions to date that the council has taken related to this paper. Section 13 of the Malden City Car Charter provides in this instance that the mayor shall have the exclusive power of nomination being subject to confirmation or rejection by the council. That's right from the, um, the city charter. At our last meeting, the motions offer, the motion offered, there were two motions offered only related to either tabling this paper or rejecting the nomination. Both motions failed to pass by a majority vote, so I have determined that the council has not taken final action on the paper. As such, the council has not fulfilled its responsibility to act to confirm or reject the nomination offered by the mayor. Keeping a paper on the docket that the council has not taken final action on is consistent with Rule 7.03 that states um, and recognizes that papers not acted upon remain active until the end of a biennial session. The city solicitor and, and city clerk and I all agree that in this instance, section 2.08.010 of the Malden City Ordinances applies, and that Mr. Oven, my, Mr. I. Oven may hold over on the planning board for uh, the time being if the you know, council remains deadlocked on this matter. Given that the council has fully discussed this appointment last meeting, um, no further discussion of this order will be in order uh, of this matter will be in order the motion to reject Mr. Iovan's reappointment has failed so the only council action or motion that I will consider to be in order for the time being will be a motion to confirm this appointment I, my decision here respects the council rule uh, is okay that, so that's that's the end of my decision that um, the only motion that I would consider to be in order would be a motion to confirm um, this appointment. Um, if, if no counselor advances uh, that recommendation, I will. We can go on to the next order of business. So, um, Councilor Colin Hayes, I see you. Oh, so, uh, yeah, let me show what with, um, I see. Paper, but I just to again, as I did last okay. time this was up. So, so, I would like to take a vote to let's, have. All right, so Councilor Colin Hayes vote is asked to recuse herself. Um, uh, can clerk take uh, the role on that uh, request? Councilor Colon Hayes? Yes. Councilor Condon? Yes. Councilor Crow? Yes. Councilor Linehan? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councilor O'Malley? Yes. Councilor Sika? No. Councilor Simonelli? No. Councilor Spedafora? Yes. Councilor Taylor? Yes. Council President Winslow? Yes. So, Councillor Colin Hayes, you are recused from uh, this matter. Thank you. So, and then, um, so, Councillor Spadafora, are you, uh, uh, will you be making the appropriate motion, or? Do we have to take it off the table? It's not on the table. It's old business. So, it's no, you, any, any uh, councillor can make a motion. So, can I have the clerk read exactly, because I want to make sure I'm not confused in terms of what the motion would be. So, make a motion to, I want to. So the motion would be to confirm the appointment. Confirm. Okay. Can I speak on my confirmation? You have a second? Okay. I want so, to speak on my count. I want to speak on my count. You have a second by Councilor. Okay, so we have a motion to confirm, a second by Councilor Crow. As I said, we had a full discussion of this matter before, so any discussion is not in order because we had a full discussion at last meeting. Do you want to discuss on the motion? So the, the, this, to, this is basically to move the question. There's no debate at this point. We had, we had, had all the debate. Oh, wait, so there's, wait, 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 wait. so, so there's no uh, no further discussion. We discussed this matter fully. So we have a motion, and this is basically to move the question. So the only matter to take up here is to, um, to, uh, take the roll call vote. So clerk, please take the roll. So do you have a, a point of order, Councilor O'Malley, or? 
Mm -hmm. How can the discussion on the mo we, this motion hasn't been made? Okay, I would like to speak to this. So it's basically we had a full discussion last time. Debate was closed. The only actions in order are to. So. Okay. All right. Let's see. So, Councillor O'Malley, you're in order. All right. Thank you. I I just I. I have to say that I think Councillor Spadafore has the right to speak on his motion. We, this, okay. this motion has not been made. So i just saying last meeting, every councillor had an opportunity to discuss it, and everybody, and then, then deliberations were closed, and then motions were in order. So, so it closed automatically when no councillor asked for further discussion. So, 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 so all right. So that, if uh, that is fair, that is an appropriate motion. So is Councillor Spadafore, are you, you questioning my vote, challenging the chair? Second. Second. So Councillor O'Malley, um, I will, <laughs> you, I, since this is my challenge, you, you will be the chair. So, so now we can debate this. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> all right. Okay, the only other time this happened, I made the motion to challenge the, the chair. So, full circle. Um, so there has been a motion to challenge the ruling of the chair, which the ruling, as I understand it, was to limit debate on the motion. Uh, so I'm gonna recognize Councillor Spadafora to uh, argue that challenge to his, to his nomination. I, mean, yeah, to, I, to, I don't to, know, first of all, uh, I don't know what closed last time. This wasn't a public hearing. It was, it was debated, I will completely agree, it was de debated probably more than we had to debate it. There was a vote. That vote did not go in anywhere. It's properly before us in this docket, I, I see that. I'm making a motion now to reappoint and I'm asking permission of the council, which I've never seen a, a, a president or a council say you cannot discuss uh, any deliberation of the motion. And my favorite word that this council loves to talk about is transparency and you're not letting somebody discuss. A motion is abysmal. That's that's my record. I'm asking if I can speak on the motion. And and if I and if I remember correctly, uh, does there need to be a second? There was a second there to it. There second. was okay. So if I remember if I remember correctly, but please, you can challenge my motion um, ruling. I don't think there's debate. I think that you have stated your 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 challenge, and I think now it's the council's decision to vote up or down whether or not to allow debate on the motion by challenging the ruling of the chair. So, so I'm, I'm told by our parliamentarian that this is debatable. Uh, I see Councillor uh, Simonelli's uh, light. Councillor Simonelli for the first time. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, I, um, I, I don't even know, I, I don't know how we even got here, to be honest with you. I, you know, because I haven't heard anything um, as far as what this individual did wrong uh, on the on the planning board, I've been, it, you know, I've been here. Councillor Simonelli, I apologize. If you could just keep your comments to uh, uh, challenging the ruling of the chair and whether or not we should allow debate on the motion. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just like, I would like to uh, say that that I think that we should be allowed to have discussion on this topic. I mean, you know, this is, this is a board member that has been on the board for quite a long time, and I just haven't hear, heard any satisfactory evidence that would not allow us to confirm him. So, I mean, I guess we're at it again, and we debate it again until the cows come home then. Thank you, Councillor Simonelli. Thank you. Mr. Appreciate Brett. that. Uh, Councillor Crow. Thank you. The, um, I, I agree we should be able to have some discussion. The last time um, the, the, um, the motion was to reject, we had discussion on that. So this is a different motion. If this paper still is alive um, and it's not tabled, not anything, then it should be allowed to be debated. Thank you, Councillor Crow. Councillor McDonald, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, you know, I just wanted to ask, like, is there a way we could perhaps move forward with some discussion, but voluntarily limit ourselves? Um, knowing you all, dear colleagues, as I do, and myself, uh, 
our potential to take a long time to talk about this is reasonably high. And so I just wonder, you know, what if we just all agreed to keep it to like a minute since we've already said what we need to say? Like, would that allow us to just be able to move forward in a timely way and get to the remainder of the business on the agenda? Thank you, Councilor. I sort of asked if that would be acceptable to all parties. Uh, I'm going to go to Councilor uh, Winslow, Councilor uh, Condon, and then Councilor uh, Seco. Councilor Winslow. Okay. Um, I'm just uh, perhaps our parliamentarian and clerk could clarify this, but I'm looking at Robert's Rules of Order. Um, this is uh, section four that talks about putting the question, and basically this is my interpretation. This is why I made that ruling. It says, when debate appears to have, have closed, the chair may ask, are you ready for the question, or is there any further debate? If no one rises then to claim the floor, the chair proceeds to put the question. And that's exa exactly how we ended the last meeting. So, so I see that, that we had closed debate. So that's my interpretation. So this is page 44. So, but I say we had, so. The, my underlying, what I'm saying is the basis of my underlying ruling was that we had full deliberations last meeting and that all counselors had the opportunity to speak and no further, count, counselors had, had no further questions and um, that means that um, the, qu the question needs to be put. There was no further debate. So that's my interpretation is that under section four of Robert Rules of Order, when there's no further debate, the question needs to be put, and there's no further debate at that point, so. And it does not have to be moving the question, it's just by the fact that no counselor had, uh, was asking for a debate, so. But, would you mind? Oh, sorry, okay. Um, so I was just, I was just, I haven't read through word for word what you're reading, but I am noticing that it also says um, the presiding officer cannot close debate so long as a member who has not exhausted his right to debate desires the floor. Councillor Spedafora, because this is a new agenda and the paper has been reintroduced on this new agenda, Councillor Spedafora has expressed his desire to debate, if not defend his motion. Um, so. That would be I, how I would interpret that. So you guys I guess I would on. move the question on on the on whether my ruling is appropriate. So I I leave it at that. I don't see any need to debate it any further. Um, uh, Councillor Con uh, Councillor Condon for the first time. It's the first time that motion has been put before the council. We have not debated that motion. We denoted we. Uh, debated the motion to deny. Right, uh, he, we're proper in a doubt in the ruling of the chair. You should put it right to a vote, whether or not you vacate the chair. Thank, thank you, Councillor Condon, and uh, Councillor Sika for the first time. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Not that any sort of debate that we have this evening is going to change the outcome of this vote. But I agree, if we're allowed to put this paper back on the agenda this evening and there's a mo new motion to be made, I think that there should, if somebody wanted to, not that I plan on pressing my button again after this, but if, if somebody wanted to, they should be allowed to debate this paper. If we're allowing this paper to be put on as old business, I've never seen this before, but if we're allowing that to happen, we should be, we should be able to debate. And, like Councilor Spadafora said, we talk about transparency, but it's funny when we just want to push certain things through, certain councilors want to just push it through, and that should not be how it is. If we're going to debate things and we're going to be transparent, we need to be transparent about everything that comes before us, not just certain things that certain people want to be transparent about. We need, if Councilor Spadafora wants to speak on this paper, I think he, sh he should be able to speak on this paper. I, I think this topic is definitely we, we beat a dead horse out of it, so I think it's, it's over, but if somebody wants to debate, they should be allowed to debate. With, with that, I am going to close debate. 
Um, and we're going to take a roll call vote. Uh, the clerk will call the roll on whether or not to doubt the ruling of the chair to a limit debate. A uh, yes vote would allow debate on Councillor Spadafore's motion. A no vote would uh, with, uh, uphold Count, uh, Council President Winslow's um, denial of that, of that debate. The clerk will call the roll. Sorry, I, so is that correct? Did I say it right? Did I say it? To doubt the ruling of the chair, you're going to vote yes to doubt the ruling of the chair. A yes vote would allow debate. If I could. Yeah, please. Do you mind? Yeah. Sorry. Um, this might help. Those in favor of sustaining the president's decision say yes. Those in favor, uh, those opposed of his decision say no. What do you, what do you think? What do you think? Should we do not yes and then should we use different words so it's clear? Do you want to say that a yes vote sides with yes. Councilor Winslow and a no vote, side and a no vote council? Yes. Yes. Okay, sure. So a, ye a yes vote sides with Councilor Pre Council President Winslow and no vote will side with Councilor Spedafora. Please call the roll. Councillor Condon. No. Councillor Crow. No. Councillor Linehan. No. Councillor McDonald. No. Councillor O'Malley. Uh, I vote last, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor C. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What's the habit? Councillor Sika. No. Councillor Simonelli. No. Councillor Spedafora. No. Councillor Taylor. No. Councillor Winslow. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Present. <laughs> That's my ruling. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, we will have debate on the motion. Um, so just to remind folks, we do have um, Rule 29, which says limitations on a member's right to speak. No member shall speak more than once on the same question until all members choosing to speak have spoken and no member shall speak more than three times to the same question on the same day except by majority consent. All right, okay, so that is that is our rules. Otherwise, we'll have to suspend the rules, but debate is now open, so um, let me see. Councillor Condon, your light is lit up. Do you wish to speak further on this motion or? Okay, Councillor Condon. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> And so can count, counts, I mean, uh, I'll clerk. yield to, uh, okay, 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 okay. Wanna, it's not okay. going to be a speech. <laughs> Look at, we, uh, this is, to me, it's very embarrassing. I haven't gone through this in, uh, 34 years on the council, uh, to have somebody brought up like Mr. Iovan, who without question, is probably the most dedicated uh, member of any board we have ever appointed on this uh, by the city council, confirmed the mayor's appointment. Uh, and then we heard from one of the, to me, one of the most respected department heads in Michelle Romero. Uh, I mean, she's so dedicated. No matter when you call here, I don't. She don't have a time clock at her house, I don't think, or anything. But uh, she she's so dedicated, and she knows who does the job up there, and who's up there for whatever reason. They uh, there's always different reasons why people want to serve on a board, and uh, Chucky's is just pure dedication. You know, it's an insult to everybody that's ever served up in the planning board, the appeals board, liquor board. It really is, you know, and I, I never uh, question my fellow city councilors, but I can't figure this one out. I really cannot figure it out. Please. It's the order, please. Oh. All right, great, great. All right. All right. 
I hope that we can come together here and do the right thing. Do the right thing. That's all. Thank you. Next up, Councillor Spadafora. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I appreciate Councillor Flynn going first. Uh, let's see, one second. Let me get here, double click. All right, there you go, Councillor Spadafora. Yeah. Uh, I, I will just say this. I don't want to speak on, on the character of Chuck. I think that's been debated. What I will speak upon is you, Councillor President, used the word respect. This is the, the least demonstration of respect. I have never seen, uh, first of all, Mayor Orr's appointment. So fact check is, regardless of what happens in this body, he can stay because it's a mayor's appointment. This is a personal vendetta that even after last week nothing happened, the council president will continue to put it on the docket until the numbers change. It's a personal vendetta. It's disgusting. And can you imagine being Mr. Iovan sitting there every week you have to come to find out if you're going to be insulted or going to be fired from your job? If, if this was anybody else, this council should be embarrassed. The idea we're treating this gentleman, that he has to come every two weeks now to find out if his job is in jeopardy. He's half the man I would be. I would have walked out the door and told everybody how I fear about him. This is personal. This is not what we do in this body. It's the mayor's appointment. He came down. We vote him up. We vote it down. But I can tell you right now, what we're doing is a travesty to his personality, regardless of what you think a building should look like or a bike lane. This is not how you treat people. This is respectful. The idea of dignity, of putting them on the docket because you're the president. I'm looking at you, Mr. President, every two weeks so you can play the numbers game. I'm saying it publicly because I want everybody to see what transparency look like. It's a game. I support them. I stay with my first motion to either shoot them up or shoot them down. This is cruel and unusual punishment. Hey, Kevin, if you, I will, will have you removed. There's com no comment is out of order. Please, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Seminelli, this mic is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Look, you know, again, I'm not going to sit up here and debate uh, with Mr. I. Oven's character. I, I already said it. I just, don't, I just don't, I don't understand how we got here because, like I said. I, I don't know. No, nobody's made an argument on what the guy has done wrong um, in the in the thirty some odd years that you know he's been doing the job. I mean, listen, I, I feel as though I'm a pretty easy person to talk to, and if any of my colleagues found that you know there was something uh, that an individual that sits on a board uh, been messing up on and, and, and just not being consistent or being all over the place and just very detrimental to the city, then I'd listen. But I, I haven't heard those things. Even still, you know, a whole week has gone by and nobody's called me and, or nobody in passing has said anything derogatory. If anything, uh, every, pretty much every counselor up here has said good things about Mr. I. Oven. So then I ask you, why are we here still debating this on whether or not we're going to confirm this appointment? It really, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, I've never seen anything like this happen before, and I got to agree with Councilor Spadafore. It's, it, it, you know, we're professionals up here, and we should be, and we shouldn't be treating people uh, in this manner. I, I, I give him, I take my hat off to him too, because I, I, you all know me already. <laughs> I would have left this council and I would have took a few of you with me. But, um, you know, <laughs> no hard feelings. But, you know, I, I just, you know, I have to say that, you know, it, 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 it's not right to do that to somebody, you know? So if you can't give me a reason of, of why you don't want to confirm someone, even a reason on saying, hey, I just, you know, think this other person's better, they dress better, something. I haven't heard anything, and I just don't think it's fair to treat anybody like this uh, as we're moving forward. We're supposed to be professionals up here, so let's start acting like something. All right? Thank you. Councillor Sika. Thank you, Council President. I will be brief. I just want to go on record in stating that at the beginning of this, before we started debated, debating, you mentioned uh, that you just stated the rules and how everybody has only a certain number of times that they're allowed to speak on one particular topic. I will be counting 
every paper from here on out to make sure that nobody goes over their three, their three chances to speak for each topic. Because I've been on this council for almost 11, just going on 11 years now, and I've never seen that rule enforced, ever. I, I, I don't remember the last time we enforced a rule that only allowed us to speak three times on one, partic one particular topic. I actually forgot about it until you just brought it up again. But I, I just want to know that, I just want you to know that from here on out, everything we discuss on this floor, I will be counting how many times I speak, Councillor Crow speaks, how many times you speak, how many times Councillor Spadafora speaks. I, I think you're, this is a personal thing for you, and I think you need to put your personal feelings aside for um, Chuck Iovan, and I, I, you probably should have recused yourself from this vote the way that you've been handling it, because I think it's a horrible way of doing things, and you're setting a horrible precedent moving forward for how we reconfirm appointments. And I absolutely agree with Councilor Spatafora. This is a respect thing. You should. Everybody up here should be reappointing, reconfirming Chuck's appointment as respect to the mayor. Th that's what everybody up here should be doing. Because the truth of the matter is, and I don't know if the people at home know this, but if this vote fails tonight with a five to five vote, Chuck still stays on the planning board. The mayor does not have to send down another appointment. Tomorrow, if this fails, Chuck is not off the planning board. He stays on as a holdover. And he doesn't need to be reconfirmed in five years because he was never reconfirmed this year. So it, the, the vote to not reconfirm Chuck tonight could actually help him because if the mayor is the mayor for the next 10 years, Chuck gets to stay as a holdover for the next 10 years. So, so you're not helping anybody. Chuck should be reconfirmed and reappointed in five years if the mayor chooses to reappoint him. And if not, then he's... He's going to sit as a holdover. So putting this paper back on the agenda as old business does not change what happened two weeks ago. He's still going to be in limbo if it's a five to five vote. And, and honestly, over the weekend I sat and I tried to figure out why you were doing this. And if this stays on the paper, on the agenda every week, I'm pretty certain you're going to wait till a week that one of us five is not here and you're going to get your votes to not reconfirm Mr. Iovan. And that is a horrible way for us to be uh, doing politics up here. It's horrible, horrible. And I would hate to think that you would play that dirty as to do something like this, but that's the only thing I can think of why you would put this on as old business. We have plenty of papers that are not listed as old business that have not been acted on in, in the last two years. We can bring those up because they'd be no different than the paper that y'all use in 7.034. For. There's, there's I think one of them is the uh, Youth Council. So I think that you, know, you, you really need to choose your words because you're setting a hor horrible precedent, Con Councilor Winslow, and I'm actually doubting my vote for, for you as president. Thank you, Councilor Seeger. Councilor O'Malley. Um, so I wasn't able to talk on the, the motion to recon uh, or, or to challenge the ruling the chair. I do think it makes sense to kind of talk about um, this topic. I particularly will benefit from that um, because I am kind of on the cusp here. I had proposed a, uh, a, a tabling motion um, not because I don't think Chuck needs should be reappointed, uh, but because I, uh, out of respect for Chuck and the planning board, um, you know, we can we can we can give hard feedbacks. We can we can critique our our our, our body our our um, boards and commissions, but um, I do think it is important to be respectful. Um, and I ideally would like uh, Chuck, myself, Councillor Spetafora, Councillor Crow, to work on this master plan steering committee together and show that we can work across the aisle and get things done, and a differing of opinion produces a better product in the end. Um, I was hoping that by doing that over the next six months, nine months, however, to the end of the year, that we would get a unanimous vote to, to reconfirm um, Mr. Iovan. Um, it sounds as though 
that opportunity will not be uh, available. Um, we're gonna, uh, it looks like, take the vote tonight. Um, and I just want people to know that that's where my vote is going to go. It's, uh, uh, there have been a number of new members on the planning board over the years. Um, and uh, I do not think that, that Chuck is, is, is the problem with the planning board. Um, I think that there needs to be obviously a, a rethought of what the role of the planning board is. I would like to see more proposals coming out of the planning board in terms of what zoning they would like to see. The same way I would like to see residents come forward and present um, uh, proposals for zoning. Any, any, anyone impacted by zoning in the community can propose zoning to the city council and then we will consider it. So if you have an idea, you're welcome to do that. And if you wouldn't be impacted by the zoning, all you need to do is get 10, uh, 10 residents or 10 registered voters, it's one of the two, I don't know which, uh, and we can propose that. The Zoning Board of Appeal can also do that. Um, so I will be voting in favor of, of Mr. Ayovin's uh, nomination tonight. Um, and I look forward to working with the Planning Board. Uh, one last thing, Councillor Sika is correct. No matter how this goes, uh, Mr. Ayovin will continue to serve on the Planning Board. If we rejected his nomination, I believe he would probably most likely still be on the Planning Board. Um, if, if his nomination failed, he would still be on the Planning Board. And obviously, if we affirm it tonight, he'll be on the Planning Board. Thank you. Councillor Crow. Thank you, Mr. President. I think um, Ms. Romero's comments this morning, I mean, earlier tonight there, really summed up and gave a lot of the reasons why um, Mr. Iovan should be <clears throat> reconfirmed. In the past couple of weeks, not just around this, but in a lot of different meetings, the, the master plan has been brought up when we talked about lots of different things. And I think that we made commitments to each other. Um, I was really happy to see a memo come out from OSPCD that we are going to be working, well, they, what the work they have been doing. And thank you to Councilor O'Malley for actually having um, Ms. Cagno send it to the rest of the council. So, and again, I think we who sit on that um, are committed to moving that um, forward and being a robust master plan um, committee. I do think, you know, again, you know, Council Windsor, when she he did say respecting the the rules and all this other stuff, I do think this is really disrespectful to a resident that comes forward, puts a lot of time um, into the planning board, and is really it sends a, a message I think to our constituents that um, you know either rub a stamp or you know they, they could be kind of an issue. So. I look forward to working with the, my fellow councilors, the planning board, Mr. Iovan, on um, a moving some of these things forward. That I think this has brought up some good debate and maybe we look at a way that they know that they're empowered to make some of the zoning amendments, that we have more of those conversations if some of the members did not know, because no member has ever. There's been never one um, zoning amendment that has been proposed by any planning board member. So if they really didn't understand that, it was never really articulated, I think now really um, having more of a robust um, way to communicate with the planning board is really the way to go and with um, Mr. Iovan at the, at the helm. I thank you, Councilor Crow. Councilor Linehan. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for the opportunity to debate, to debate this. I'll also be brief. Um, I'm gonna support this appointment tonight. This is a mayoral appointment as Councillor Sika said, out of respect for the mayor and honestly the fact that we, I think, have completely beat a dead horse and whatever the vote is tonight isn't gonna change the outcome. Um, I would hope only that we not allow what we've all been through to block us from interviewing future appointments that we want to bring before personnel. I hope we never, ever, ever have to undergo another process like this. I hope we never even open these parts of our rule book or Robert's rules again, to be frank, because I don't, I know more now than I don't even want to know about things that we've, procedures that we've had to explore. Um, and, and that's on us, honestly. I mean, we have not handled this well, and I take responsibility for my role in that. Um, but we all have the right to debate and send appointments to committee, and we need to be able to still do that. I chair the ordinance committee. Nobody up here is going to work more one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Iovan on zoning issues than I am and the other members of the ordinance committee. We've disagreed over the years. We've had a respectful working relationship. 
and I hope that we can continue to do so. Our two boards are very often at odds, but as Councillor O'Malley said, if we all agreed, we wouldn't refine things to the point where they're best for the community. So we need to get back to being able to do that. I commit to doing that for my part, um, but I, I do just want us to spend some time thinking about you know, how we all could have done this differently. I think we really belabored the debate on this. This was not fair um, to, to Mr. Ioven to have to come in this many times, to be uncertain about the appointment. There's business before the planning board. Uh, we need to get back to regular business. And so I am going to be supporting this reappointment tonight, and I hope that this is the last time that we see this on the docket. Thank you. All right. Any Councillor Taylor, Councillor McDonald? Uh, go ahead, speak, Councillor McDonald. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Council President. Um, I've also been very torn about this appointment, which, as I had said earlier, you know, is is not a personal reflection on Mr. Iovin. I I think that. We have, um, I mean, I agree that this is this has uh, been an unnecessarily difficult process uh, for someone who has dedicated, who has been dedicated in their role. I also do want to echo my colleague, uh, Councilor Linian, that it is, I, I do believe it's our role and our responsibility um, to uh, take seriously when we have questions about a reappointment. And, uh, you know, the the concerns that I have about the process and the policy, uh, you know, the, the role of policy setting and shaping related to the planning board. Mr. Iovin certainly plays a major role in that, but it is not all it is not all his responsibility by any means because the board does take votes. Um, I actually would like to have similar, hopefully not exactly similar conversations, but as our planning board members come up for reappointment, I really do want to have conversations with them um, about moving forward and about what the process is like um, for people who are applying for permits and how we really talk about what is a policy decision and what is a planning decision and, and what basis we're using for those. That's one of my primary concerns is that we have not had language to be clear enough about that across our various roles, across what we do as the council, what our city staff does, and what the planning board decides. And that leads to some pretty major confusion. Um, so that's my concern. That's what I hope will be addressed. And um, given that I am on the fence, I am willing to defer to my colleagues who have um, been in this dynamic longer than I have and uh, and uh, and support Mr. Iovin um, and uh, will work diligently, as I, as I hope we all will, uh, to both address the valid concerns that do exist um, for all of our planning board members and the process, um, as well as to just remember that, you know, we all play a role in personalizing this um, and that it, it is important for us to make uh, space and, and respectful process for us to fulfill our role uh, as counselors in reviewing critical appointments. Thank you. Any further debate on this subject? Not hearing any further debate. I, under Robert Rule Section 4, <laughs> Um, I say that the debate is closed and I would entertain a vote on the question. Clerk, can you read the question and then uh, take a roll call vote? Motion was made by Councilor Spadafora, seconded by Councilor Crow to confirm the reappointment of Charles Iovan to the planning board. Councilor Condon? Yes. Councilor Crow? Yes. Councilor Linehan? Yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor Sika. Yes. Councillor Simonelli. Yes. Councillor Spedafora. Yes. Councillor Taylor. Yes. Council President Winslow. Yes. We've gone from check your unanimous vote. Thank, thank you for the patience on the process, but I think we look forward to working so right. All right, next order of business, thank you. Okay, all right, oh, that's right, we gotta get Karen, we'll go on to our next order of business, so. Together. 
Oh, yes. All right. So next order of business, motions, orders, and resolutions. The clerk will raid the next two papers, uh, which are related to. Thank you, Greg. Paper 176-24, <coughs> order the, Mal the City of Malden file with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the consolidated plan, including applications for grants under the Housing and Community <coughs> Development Act of 1974 as amended and the Cranston-Gonzalez Housing Act of 1990 as amended to be administered by the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development for the fiscal year 2025, including all understanding and assurances contained therein on or substantially in the form presented to this meeting, and that Gary Christensen, Mayor and Chief Executive Officer of the City of Malden, be and hereby is directed and designated as the authorized representative for and in the name and behalf of the City of Malden to sign and file said plan, to act in connection with said plan, and to provide such additional information as may be required. Companion paper 177-24 order that the mayor be authorized to file an application for grants under the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 and the Cranston-Gonzalez Housing Act of 1999, the CDBG budget. And we do have a letter of support from the mayor on this paper. All right. Clerk, the mayor has asked us uh, to read the letter into the record, so could you please read the mayor's letter into the record? Thank you. Dear members of the city council, I submit for your review and consideration our proposed fiscal year 2025 community development block grant budget. As the city prepares for looming financial pressures, this budget continues to make prudent investments in projects, programs, and services that will support our low and moderate income population through the next fiscal year. This budget illustrates the impact of CDBG on our community. The housing rehabilitation program makes homes and apartments safer and more livable for low income residents and leverages funds from other federal grant programs to expand the impact of every dollar. The public services program expands the impact of our nonprofit organizations working on housing, youth services, elder services, and English language learning. CDBG supported physical improvements includes upgrades to the tot lot at MacArthur Park, additional funds to complete the Fitzgerald Park expansion, and our long-term commitment to ADA accessible pedestrian infrastructure, which for the first time will now include upgrades to key bus stops throughout the city. The budget also covers our repayment obligations under previous Section 108 loans, which have allowed us to expand the impact of our program. Finally, this budget funds the continued administration of CDBG program by the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development, who continues to effectively lead this program for the city. As in previous years, Congressional Deliberations on CDBG budget extended beyond a typical calendar. Therefore, this budget assumes a 4.4% decrease in CDBG entitlement funding and includes our contingency plan on how funds will be spent if funds come in higher or lower than that figure. If we receive updated figures from HUD prior to Council's final action, we may submit an updated budget responding to the latest available information. The deadline for submitting an improved CDBG budget to HUD is May 15th. Please do not hesitate to contact me with any questions about the proposal. In the meantime, thank you for your time and consideration. Sincerely, Gary Christensen, Mayor, City of Malden. All right, so Councillor McDonald for the paper. Yes, thank you. Uh, and just to remind the viewers at home, this is not my plan at all. I am merely uh, the carrier for this paper as the chair of the finance committee. I wanted to let folks know that we uh, are planning to have our required public hearing on this on uh, April 23rd. So that's not next week, but the following week uh, and would make a motion to refer this to the finance committee. All right. Second the motion. Councillor Colon Hayes. Um, all uh, let's, clerk will take the roll to refer to uh, both these papers to finance. Um, Councillor Cologne Hayes, yes. Councillor Condon, yes. Councillor Crow, yes. Councillor Linehan, yes. Councillor McDonald, yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. Councillor Sika, yes. Councillor Simonelli, yes. Councillor Spedafora, yes. Councillor Taylor, yes. Councillor Council President Winslow. Yes, um, this paper is referred. These papers are referred to committee. Uh, next order of business.
Um, you want to read the next order of business there? It's 178 24. Okay, all right, yeah, okay, so good, take a little more time. Yeah, they have double one. Okay, all right. Okay, great. Paper 178-24, order that the City Council explore a range of options and consider making recommendations for increasing revenue to support the long-term sustainability of city finances. So we have uh, Councillor Linehan and Councillor McDonald for the paper. Um, which would you like, uh, Councillor McDonald, would you like to speak first, or Councillor Linehan? I'll be really brief and then I All right, okay, so count, we'll start with Councillor Linehan and then Councillor McDonald. Yep, um, I'm happy to pass the mic to Councillor McDonald in a moment, but I think this paper really needs no more introduction than the presentation that we had for the first 90 minutes of our meeting. <laughs> um, our goal here is really to open up a space for us to be able to talk about the long-term city financial outlook, um, revenue options, really any idea that we want to put forward and have a space to talk about that that's not tied to any one paper or ordinance proposed, um, just to sort of open up that conversation. Uh, we are doing this in partnership with our council president and the mayor's office, all of whom are trying to work together to get to, obviously, a solution space on the um, fiscal challenges ahead. So I'll hand it over to Councillor McDonald to talk a little bit more about how we got to this point, but really hoping that most folks can make it when we do schedule this meeting and that we'll have a really productive conversation and brainstorm and generate some creative ideas. All right. Councillor McDonald. Yeah, thank you. And... Um, Councillor Linehan's exactly right. I mean, the the why is so clear. I just wanted to say another word about the the process that um, that I think we're hoping for here is yes to get those creative juices flowing and for us to be part of the solution for us to be solutionaries here. I like the, I'm going to keep saying that word and and it's going to be obnoxious, but you're going to remember it. Let's be solutionaries in all the ways that we can for our city budget. Um, and really, we're interested in talking about the ideas that are not already being covered by another process. So not big picture changes that will be moving through the master plan process, not necessarily um, the work that we already just heard is in motion with our state delegation. And we're not trying to have a conversation about what city departments we think we should cut. Um, this is really about exploring things big and small from fees um, to benchmarking our costs and best practices, um, really whatever idea that you might have. And I would really ask every counselor to come to these, um, to come to uh, this meeting. It will probably be more than one, as Councilor Linehan said, a rolling conversation um, with at least one idea. I mean, more better. This is a brain. We're starting at a brainstorming level to see if there are some things that we can put on the table, uh, and we imagine doing this as a joint fine, a series of joint finance and ordinance meetings because many types of changes that we might consider that could have a financial impact would also require ordinance changes, and it also gives us a way to make sure that everybody on the counts, all all of our colleagues, uh, are invited to fully participate in the conversation because everybody's on one of those committees. And so, um, yeah, so I just hope you'll you'll bring your brainstorm ideas, big and small, um, and see if we can uh, help uh, bring some solutions to the table. Be solutionaries. I hope you'll join us. We haven't, I don't think we've scheduled this yet, so Councilor and I, Linehan and I will talk about this, but um, we know that the city budget uh, timeline is looming, and so I think in the next couple of weeks we'll be looking um, for one or more meetings for these discussions. And so uh, I'm happy to make a motion at the right time to refer to joint finance and rules and ordinance. We have a few counselors who want to say something. Councilor Colon Hayes. Uh, I, I don't want to keep us here any longer. Yeah. I just wanted to know if I could be added as a sponsor. It's a great idea. All Thank right. You. Is that all right? Everybody? Okay. And then <laughs> Councilor O'Malley. Uh, th thank you both. Um, so I was I, I I felt like I had deja vu and don't and don't take this the wrong way I feel I feel like we had already voted on this paper previously so I looked I searched revenue, um, and and it it looks as though we passed a very similar paper which was resolution two five five dash twenty three um, in June of twenty twenty three and it said and it reads. Resolved that it is the sense of the city, the Mullen City Council, that the city uh, must develop a plan to increase local revenue in the next three to five years to match projected future expenses, in addition to the regular annual inflation of city salaries and costs currently projected for the city, um, which include you know capital investments for schools, uh, facilities, roads. So it goes into all of the things we want to do, uh, and so I'm just wondering what progress has been made on on that resolution that was passed. 
and, and how does this differ? Uh, and I do know that there's also, I think, the long-term uh, financial da -da 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 committee, sustainability, and I'm just wondering, like, how does that overlap with that committee um, before just passing another resolve? Thank you. All right. I think I have an answer related to long-term financial committee. Let me just get that right. So, um, uh, I believe in my memo establishing the committees that this year, we, we don't, we, that basically that's the responsibility of the finance committee. So, um, so that the long-term finance committee is just, it doesn't exist. It's just part of the finance responsibility of the finance committee. So, so uh, Councilor McDonald, Councilor Linhan, do you want to respond to the other thing or is that something you want to consider as, as you take up the paper? Okay, let's see, let me put you on there. Councilor Linehan and then Councilor McDonald. Yeah, yeah um, I would just say that this is an order, not a resolve, so I think they can work in concert. And um, my recollection of that resolve is that it was in response to kind of the first, like, dire warning presentation that we had had in finance from the city staff about what we might be facing this year. So while I think that was, you know, a, a, a strong thing for us to put out there at the time, I don't know that we met about it or had any discussion. So I think that this, you know, could take, certainly take where that, picked up and, and keep going. Um, but the hope is to send this, as Councilor McDonald said, to joint rules and ordinance, and where it is in order, hopefully we can make some recommendations from it. But I don't see those things as being in conflict. It sounds like we were already on the same page with ourselves a year ago. All right, Councilor McDonald, do you have any response there? Uh, you know, let me just plus one all of that. The, this is really just a vehicle so that we can have a conversation in joint rules and ordinance. Um, we're not asking you. To, we're not asking folks to pass anything, and then we'll see what comes out of that. I do think the master plan process is one of the things that um, you know certainly came out or accelerated from that from uh, the conversations that led to that resolve and and the accompanying resolve, which was about Chapter seventy funding. You can see the work that's happened on that. So um, happy to discuss that, but really this is just so we can get the convo started at an at the next level. All right. Uh any further discussion? I don't see any more lights. So let's take a motion to uh, Councilor McDonald. Make a motion to uh, send this paper to joint session of ordinance and finance. Seconded by Councilor Linehan. Um, clerk will take the roll. Councilor Colon Hayes. Yes. Councilor Condon. Yes. Councilor Crow. Yes. Councilor Linehan. Yes. Councilor McDonald. Yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor Sika. Yes. Councilor Simonelli. Yes. Councilor Spedafora. Councilor Taylor. Yes. Council President Winslow. Yes. That paper is referred. Next order of business. Paper 179-24 order that the Council's Rules and Ordinance Committee in collaboration with the Board of Health and Health Director update MCC 9.04.010A related to standing water so as to protect and allow for the use of rain barrels, exempting them from the nuisance category of our Municipal Health Code under the final discretion of the City Health Director. All right, um, Councillors Linehan and McDonald for the paper. Councillor Linehan, you would, would like to go ahead? Sure. Oh, let's see. It's, I got it there. All right, there you go. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so, again, this is something that we're hoping to send to uh, the Ordinance Committee. Councillor McDonald and I had decided to draft this um, in anticipation of the launch of the city's new rain barrel program, which I believe was publicized over city alerts this past weekend. Um, this isn't something that's necessarily required, but something that we just thought was prudent in order to basically protect the ability of residents who do opt into the rain barrel program to not um, suffer complaints about standing water, which our nuisance ordinance covers things that you know may attract insects or um, other like rodents, things like that. And um, we want to make sure that there's both an enshrined ability for residents to utilize the, the rain barrels, but also um, we hope to put in some guideposts for the right way to use them. Um, for example, you know, you may need to elevate it, um, it needs to have a spigot on it. Um, there's things more than just the standing water component that we're hoping to touch on. And we've um, spoken to inspectional services and the health director um, and would hope that they can come to our meeting, which we've already invited them to, just to kind of flesh it out. And then just before I defer to Councillor McDonald, I did want to just point out also um, that we passed a resolve a few months ago that I had filed that opens the same section of the code in order to look at um, the overgrowth description and in order to allow 
pollinator gardens. And so our hope is that we'll actually address both of those issues at the same time in committee, since we've ref we will have referred two things to committee that address the same area of the code. All right, uh, Council McDonald, do you have anything to add? That was great. I would just say the water department and OSPCD staff are also in the loop on this. They're the ones that prompted us to take a look at this. And um, we'll be doing some bear some rain barrel launching at the Green Malden Fair on April 28th. So this is very timely. Great. See you there. Um, if, and anybody else? I, I would like to be added as co-sponsor to this paper. Uh, if you can do that. Are you okay with that? Yeah. So please add me as a co-sponsor. I, I have a rain barrel myself and it comes in handy and that type of thing. So hopefully that's not a conflict of interest, but I will. <laughs> so, all right, Councilor O'Malley. Yeah, let's see. Get you there. Go ahead. I would also like to disclose my conflict of interest of having a rain barrel. <laughs> <laughs> I have three. Like standing water. <laughs> <laughs> I have three of them, uh, and I also have uh, the 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 maybe the unkempt, more natural looking uh, lawn. So please don't come after me. Um, the only thing I would say, though is that we do need to make sure that the rain barrels that people have are covered and are not uh, collecting stagnant water that is a breeding ground for mosquitoes and other, other pests. Uh, this is a really big issue in Malden. Um, I can think of at least 25 properties where they just collect water in uh, you know, open barrels a, a lot. I'm sure all around the city. No, 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 not. No. Um, no, I think that it's, so. We just have to be careful about that because obviously, you know, with uh, all the different things that uh, are a breeding ground with mosquitoes. Um, so I think an education component would be really helpful, uh, and it sounds like that's something that will be happening at the at the Green Malden uh, with some of the giveaway. You're giving them away, or are they cheap? No, there's a cost. It's okay, a cost. cool. Okay. Thank you. Good. Councilor Linehan. Yeah. Um, I just appreciate that and wanted to address it. I think. Um, you know, it is funny. I went out, I've had a rain barrel for a few years. We paid a lot of money for it. They're really hard to come by. They sell out really fast in the spring. If you go to Mahoney's or a garden center, I want to say mine was probably like $150 and these are going to cost, I'll let Councilor McDonald say what the actual cost is, but I think it's going to be like a deeply discounted rate. Um, he was able to forward me a thread with the manufacturer where they do have, it's, it's, a, it's a sealed top. It does have an insect screen, but what I realized when I looked at mine is that it, does allow some standing water, and so I'm gonna have to basically retrofit it with something that will make it comply, but I'm glad that we're doing this because it will educate people. Um, we definitely do plan to get some educational materials out there. And then the other interesting point that we noticed when we were researching this is that some states you know, ban rain barrels. Massachusetts is a state that explicitly allows them, so whether your municipality has a, a local ordinance or not, you can still have one, but it also says that you can DIY it, so for me, I love DIY, but that's like a red flag that we don't want to just have it be like the Wild West, like just because DIY is allowed by state law. We don't want to just have people have open containers and, you know, things that, like you said, create a problem with insects or are otherwise um, a genuine issue. So the hope is to strike the balance between not making it overly restrictive and have neighbors complain about each other when, you know, they just don't like the look of the rain barrel or something like that, but also make sure that people are utilizing them safely and keeping public health. Okay, um, on Councillor Linehan's motion to move this to rules and ordinance, seconded by Councillor Sponsor too. And oh, Councillor O'Malley would like to be added as sponsor. Anybody else? All right. So, um, and Councillor O'Malley's second. Clerk will please take the roll. Councillor Colon Hayes. Yes. Councillor Condon. Yes. Councillor Crow. Yes. Councillor Linehan. Yes. Councillor McDonald. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor Sika. Yes. Councillor Simonelli. Yes. Councillor Spedafora. Yes. Councillor Taylor. Council President Winslow. Council President Winslow, yes. That paper is referred to rules and ordinance. Next order of business, committee reports. Paper 18024, committee report. The Standing Committee on License, to whom was referred papers 483 and 484, series of 2023, and papers 150 through 155, series of 2024, having considered the same, make the following report. Committee recommends these papers out favorably to the full council. Further, it is recommended paper 150-24 be granted with conditions that 24-hour day service is allowed. Uh, all those in favor of the motion say aye. Um, um, Councilor Colon Hayes. Okay. Councilor Condon. Yes. Councilor Crow. <laughs> Councilor Linehan. Yes. Councilor McDonald. Yes. Councilor O'Malley. 
Council Seco. Yes. Council Simonelli. Yes. Council Spadafora. Yes. Council Taylor. Yes. Council President Winslow. Yes. The committee report received. Uh, <coughs> council. Uh, let's see. All right. So Councilor Seco for the uh, on the re committee report. Could the clerk review, please? Oh. Oh, so thank you. Read yes, ma'am, I will. All right. Paper 483-23 petition, Livery Company AB Limo Services, Inc., 51 Claremont Street, Malden, one vehicle renewal. Paper 484-23 petition, Livery Driver, Ed Dehirm Bookchark, 51 Claremont Street, Malden, renewal. Paper 150-24 petition, Exterior Vending Machine, Rocky Mountain Spring Water Company, one Wesley Street, Malden, new. Paper 151-24, Petition Livery Company, Lobsang, Inc., 271 Charles Street, Malden, one vehicle new. Paper 152-24, Petition Livery Driver, Lobsang, Tenzin, 271 Charles Street, Malden, new. Paper 153-24, Petition Livery Company, Zingzai T Service, LLC, 15 Burridge Place, Malden, one vehicle renewal. Paper 154-24, Petition Livery Driver, Zingzang Lang, 15 Burridge Place, Malden, new. Paper 155-24, Petition Taxi Driver John P. Walters, 5 Hancock Street, Everett, Mass. Renewal. Okay, now, Councilor Seeker, for the paper. Great. And yet, that's another thing. I, okay, <laughs> Councilor Seeker, for the paper. Thank Great. you, Council Thank President. You. Uh, the License Committee met last Tuesday regarding these um, various petitions. We met with the compliance guys. There were no issues with any of these licenses. The committee voted unanimously to pass them on the floor this evening. So a motion to approve these petitions. Motion to approve, seconded by Councillor Taylor. Uh, clerk will take the roll. Councillor Clone Hayes. Yes. Councillor Condon. Councillor Crow. Yes. Councilor Linehan. Yes. Councilor McDonald. Yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor Sika. Yes. Councilor Seminelli. Yes. Councilor Spedafora. Yes. Councilor Taylor. Yes. Council President Winslow. Yes. That pe the petitions are hereby granted. Next order of business. Paper 181-24 committee report the standing committee on rules and ordinance in a joint session with finance committee to whom was referred papers 156 and 157 series of 2024 having considered the same make the following report. Joint committees unanimously recommend both papers out favorably to the full council. All right, on uh, Councillor Linehan's motion to receive the committee report, seconded by Councillor McDonald. A clerk will call the roll. Councillor Colon Hayes. Yes. Councillor Condon. Councillor Crow. Yes. Councillor Linehan. Yes. Councillor McDonald. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor Sika. Yes. Councillor Simonelli. Yes. Councillor Spadafora. Yes. Councillor Taylor. Council President Winslow. Yes. Clerk will read the first paper. Paper 156-24, be it ordained by the Malden City Council that the Code of the City of Malden be hereby amended by adding sections 2.24.035, Clerk Salary Schedule, 2.24.045, Engineering Salary Schedule, 2.24.055, Health and Public Safety Salary Schedule, and 2.24.065 public health salary schedule. All right, uh, Councillor Linehan for the committee. Oh, oh and that, that uh, yep, thank you again. Thank you, that, that, all right. thank you Mr. Great. President. Um, so as the clerk said, we met in a joint session with the Finance Committee. Um, this basically, you know, is our standard practice, pulls into the ordinance with a matching financial paper, um, and in this case is taking previously unorganized Positions that are coming into Local 25, getting them a COLA retro to last June, and then getting us through the next couple of months of the year, um, at which point we'll have a good faith effort towards doing the salaries moving forward, um, and our committee unanimously recommended this favorably. All right. So we have uh, any, any discussion? All right. Uh, Councillor Crow, you want to uh, second that paper? All right. So, so on Councillor Linehan's motion to... Um, uh, Enroll the ordinance, uh, seconded by Councillor Crow. Uh, clerk will take the roll. <coughs> Councillor Colon Hayes. Yes. Councillor Condon. Yes. Councillor Crow. Yes. Councillor Linehan. Yes. Councillor McDonald. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor Sika. Yes. Councillor Simonelli. Yes. Councillor Spedafora. Yes. Councillor Taylor. Yes. Councillor President Winslow. Yes. All right, that paper is enrolled. Um, uh, do we want to take uh, entertain a motion to um, ordain this and suspend the rules to ordain this? So, 
Councillor Condon, seconded by Councillor Linehan. Um, so, Clerk will call the roll on the motion to suspend the rules to allow this paper to be ordained. Councillor Clone Hayes, yes. Councillor Condon, yes. Councillor Crow, yes. Councillor Linehan, yes. Councillor McDonald, Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Oh, sorry, Councillor McDonald. I, I was a yes. Okay. Councillor Seeker, yes. Councillor Simonelli, yes. Councillor Spedafora, yes. Councillor Taylor, yes. Councillor President Winslow. Yes. So the rules are suspended. We can now uh, take a motion to ordain. Councillor Crow, motion to ordain this ordinance, seconded by Councillor Simonelli. Clerk will call the roll on the motion to ordain. Councillor Colon Hayes. Yes. Councillor Condon. Yes. Councillor Crow. Yes. Councillor Linehan. Yes. Councillor McDonald. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Sika. Yes. Sorry, I thought you were gone when you didn't answer my <laughs> point. <laughs> All right. Councillor Simonelli. Yes. Councillor Spadafora. Yes. Councillor Taylor. Yes. Councillor President Winslow. Uh, yes, that that paper is now ordained. Um, and we'll take the next uh, paper up. Uh, Councillor, let's see. No, um, no, this is where we have Councillor McDonald for the committee on the finance paper, 157.24, right? 157-24, yes. order that the sum of 500 and fifty-six thousand one hundred dollars be transferred from salary reserve to the following accounts. All right, uh, Councillor McDonald for the committee. Just very briefly, this is the appropriation to fund those changes that we just ordained in the city code for uh, these classifications of employees. So I would make a motion that we uh, approve the order. All right, uh, Councillor McDonald's motion to approve the order. Seconded by Councillor Colon Hayes. Um, clerk will call the roll. Councillor Colon Hayes. Yes. Councillor Condon. Yes. Councillor Crow. Yes. Councillor Linehan. Yes. Councillor McDonald. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor Sika. Yes. Councillor Simonelli. Yes. Councillor Spedafora. Yes. Councillor Taylor. Yes. Councillor President Winslow. Yes. The um, that order is adopted. The clerk will call the roll. Paper 182-24, committee report, the Standing Committee on Public Property, to whom was referred paper 160 series of 2024, having considered the same, make the following report. Committee recommends the paper out favorably as amended to the full city council. All right, um, this is, is this is 160-24? Yes. All right, all right, so I will, um, I just would like to um, recuse myself because this involved the bike kitchen, which is associated with Bike to the Sea, which I am closely associated with, though I am not a member. So, um, so Councillor O'Malley will, uh, I guess, take the roll on that, second. and then I will. Do we have a second? All those in favor of Councillor uh, Winslow's motion to recuse himself? Roll call. Oh, roll call, please. Councillor Clone Hayes. Yes. Councillor Condon. Yes. Councillor Crow. Yes. Councillor Linehan. Yes. Councillor McDonald. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor Sika. Yes. Councillor Simonelli. Yes. Councillor Spedafora. Yes. Councillor Taylor. Yes. Councillor Winslow. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Winslow has left the room. On, <laughs> is there a motion to receive the committee report? On Councillor Simonelli's motion to receive the committee report. The clerk will call the roll. Seconded by Councillor Taylor. Oh, there's a. Sorry. <laughs> Councillor Colon Hayes. Yes. Councillor Condon. Yes. Councillor Crow. Yes. Councillor Linehan. Yes. Councillor McDonald. Yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor Sika. Yes. Councillor Simonelli. Yes. Councillor Spedafora. Yes. Councillor Taylor. Yes. The committee report has been received. Uh, Councillor McDonald for the committee. Oh, uh, the clerk. Yes. Is, sorry, Councillor McDonald, the clerk is going to read the paper. I apologize. Oh, okay. Paper 160 24, order that in accordance with MGL Chapter 44, Section 53A, the City of Malden accepts a gift of funds in the form of a parcel of land from 33 Green Street LLC, DBA, Hoffs Bakery, located at Zero Canal Street known and numbered as Malden's Assessor's Parcel 063 
239-916, Care 24 referred to as the bike kitchen, to be utilized as a bike repair station or bike kitchen by the general public who utilize the Northern Strand Community Trail abutting the property to the east. And I do have the amended language, Councillor McDonald, if you'd rather me read that as well into the record. That would be great, thank you. Order that in accordance with MGL Chapter 44, Section 53A, the City of Malden accept an unrestricted gift in the form of a parcel of land from 33 Green Street, LLC, DBA, Hoffs Bakery, located at Zero Canal Street, known and numbered as Malden Assessors Parcel 063239916. The mayor is authorized to execute an agreement for use of the parcel as the bike kitchen to be utilized as a bike repair station by the general public who use the Northern Strand Community Trail abutting the property to the east subject to legal and purchasing review. Councilor McDonald for the paper. Uh, yes, I will just speak to the process and then I think Councilor Crow, who sponsored the paper spoke ably to the important uh, mission of the bike kitchen, which just had its unveiling this week or its, or its uh, ribbon cutting this week. Um, but we did refer this to the Public Property Committee because uh, we really wanted to think a little more carefully about the precedent involved in this um, and the details of how the city accept parcels of land. And so the language that you heard gets us really to the same place but makes some slight distinctions and changes in language um, to make sure that it's clear that the city is accepting uh, a piece of land and that is subject to all of our normal requirements on use of city land and resources. Um, that the, our acceptance of the land is not contingent on a forever 100 to 200 year use for a specific reason, um, but that that is the clear purpose. And so that that's not something that uh, for whatever reason, another entity or group could come in and say, well, I would like to use this parcel for this purpose. So I think that we've accomplished that with these tweaks in language, and I hope that that will be helpful for future precedent uh, setting to be mindful of those of those issues in terms of both you know, liability in how uh, we are allocating our city resources, but also in terms of um, just having a clearer process in terms for how we uh, accept and deal with uh, something as important as a, as a gift of property. So I just think we're really excited about the bike kitchen moving forward and grateful that we could just take a little bit more time to get this piece of it right. Thank you, Councilor McDonald. Uh, Councilor Crow. Thank you. Um, so we we did have a really great conversation. I think there was a lot, still a lot of like sort of unanswered questions about the way that they have a lease and there was a lease that had been expired and whether that's you know carried forward if they did the lease again. Um, so what the fair market value of that piece of property would be, and if we're subject to the um, proper procurement laws. And that triggers, it seems to be triggers, depends on how much money and who uh, those. So this is separate from the lease that they would have. This is just accepting the property. If you. Th thank you, Councillor Crow. Um, Councillor Spadafora for the first time. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and I appreciate. I, I, I was not able to. I, I missed the tail end of that meeting last week, and I did read Councilor McDonald's amendment. It, it kind of clarifies. I think fills in the blank what I was concerned about, uh, and then I spoke to Council Crow. So let me go on the record and saying, first of all, I have no problem with the bike kitchen being there. What I what I do want to make sure that we're doing it is what exactly Councilor McDonald said is we are we we set precedent right, and I've gone through this before. Uh, the Emerson School was an area, a building that we, the city, gave to, to a couple great organizations. Um, they were all nonprofits. Unfortunately, they weren't able to pay their bills for like several years, and we get in trouble with the state from a procurement uh, perspective. Um, so my question really is, I think, to this committee is, uh, I, it's a chicken and the egg, because right now, the bike kitchen's already on that property, which we do not own yet, so there's no liability from my perspective. We're not, we don't have any concern, but... What I want to make sure we do is have a real discussion on how we value this. And I, I'm not trying to put the bike to see out of business. But again, we can't pick winners and losers with public property. And given the discussion that we need every dollar that counts, I think we just have to be very direct and transparent in this discussion. So when I pulled up that piece of property, they have an assessed value right now. It's, it's a 4,330 square feet. 
The assessed value is $159,000, which I was actually kind of shocked. I don't know what that translates into commercial tax rule. Let's say it's 20 bucks. It's not big dollars, and that's not what I'm getting to. I do want to make sure that we are covered from a liability standpoint. Um, what's going to be happening, they're going to be fixing things, they're going to be tools, accidents happen. I know we have a lot of lawyers in the committee. They sue everybody, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is the use. We want to make sure the bike to see has certain uses, right, and what they can and can't do there. Again, have to set a standard. And then, Council Crow, you mentioned, I, I did some research on 30B. Uh, it's not even just the value, it's the in, in, intrinsical value, meaning if, if it should be worth 3000 because that's how you can get around it, right? You can say, oh, we're not going to lease it for the real value. We're going to make up this pretend value to go skirt the 30B rules. So what they basically say in the, the law is if, if it should be worth $1,000, and I think it's 35000 is, is oh, so let's say it's 35000 I think is the number that's going to hit for the procurement laws. But if you sign a five-year lease and it's 500 bucks a, a month, you could, be, you could be close to that $35,000 or use $1,000 a month. So my point is, and I know I'm long-winded here, is if we accept this property now, are we going to make sure that everything's contingent before the bike to the sea actually takes, because they're, they're there now. So we have no liability right now. And I don't know if we have to do the procurement first or we have to even do procurement or we accept the property, but I'm just nervous that we do something wrong and this sets precedent down the road. And again, I want it, and I know we probably don't have all the answers here because they're already there, right? So my question is, if they weren't there, we'd take the property, we'd go through procurement, right, and then we'd sign a lease with them. So is everything going to be contingent of us getting that lease and all those other questions answered before we take this property, or are we going to take the property and hope they get this done? And if we do that, the latter, which I'm not against, I would want to see that lease come through this body and also within, like, a 90-day window, right? We there's we have to make sure that you know nothing's for free anymore I mean we got to stress what we just went through right so that those are really a question but my points in terms of I, I missed that last meeting I want to make sure that I kind of get my point across so thank you mr. president I mean I go to uh, Councillor McDonald to clarify and then I have a few things to share after uh, I think these are good points Councillor Spadafor we talked about a lot of these pieces yeah. um, and I think that we were we were we were stuck in a place of trying to make sure that the that we were not restricting future use based on a specific agreement for eternity, um, but that it was clear also that the purpose of the property being given was to continue the current use that's there. I would encourage you to to read through the. It's not a lease; it's a license agreement. Um, if you haven't already, because I think uh, what our city solicitors staff what our city our law department staff told us is you know that's the template that they're going to use and it does require liability um insurance uh on bike to the, which bike to the sea has it you know holds us harmless for anything and and makes them responsible for uh maintenance of the property and mowing the grass and things like that so i think there's a good framework there for us to build on i mean if you would feel more comfortable putting a time limit on it or saying that well you know the effectiveness the effective date of this um shall be the effective the the date that the that the agreement is executed uh, i think we could add that too i think we were just proceeding with in good faith given our conversation with the staff um that they were ready to do this and um but if you want to put a trigger in like that i i'd be happy to support an amendment like that oh sorry councilor spada for the second just a, a point of, of reference there so i read the agreement and the agreement looked to expire in february again my my issue is uh, it was a dollar plus the taxes. So my question is, if you took a similar piece of property and somebody else wanted it, are we going to use that template to say it's a dollar plus the taxes? That's what I'm concerned about. I don't want to set precedent with this. And if if 30B comes into play, is it a lease versus a license agreement? That that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, if something gets triggered, are we going to we going to copy this license agreement or are we going to get a lease? It could be the same dollar value in terms of that. I just want to make sure that whatever we do here. Is, is able to be done somewhere else because I can assure you, I've been here long enough, it will come up again. And I don't want to get pigeonholed in, even though they're a great organization, we can't pick winners and losers. That's not our job. Treat everybody with the same, you know, same type of uh, look, and that's why there's a procurement law. So I just want to make sure all those things are dotted, and that's why if, if we're going to go down that road at least 90 days before we get, we get that contract up and running. That's it. Thank you, Mr. President, for the second time. Thank you, uh, Councillor Spedafora. And just from the chair, I did speak with Assistant City Solicitor uh, Sammy 
uh, who had said that the, the office is working on some of the things that we mentioned in committee. Um, we, uh, we did talk about dividing the paper, um, if possible. It, can, can we, because it seems like it's two distinct ones. The first one is accepting the property. Uh, and the second one, to Councillor Spedafor's point, is this more, a little bit more of a complicated, like, we'll take the property, like, like that's not the big issue. Um, the, the issue is this next step of how do we properly comply with the procurement law um, when it comes to actually programming it. Um, that one, I do think that we need a little bit more time. Um, I can't make any motions, but, uh, you know, if we were able to divide the paper, you know, maybe we can move forward with the first portion of it. Uh, maybe we can, you know, table the, the second portion of it to allow the, the legal department a little bit more time to figure out that. Um, so if there are any uh, motions, Councilor McDonald. Uh, you know, I, I hear you, Council Chair. I, I actually have a concern about dividing the paper, which is I think that we agreed in committee that there is a valid public purpose and the which is about supporting the bike trail that is not a fungible purpose um in terms of like the land could be used for anything we wouldn't be willing to entertain that um which i think is a different situation so i think we we did have some conversation for a while on whether we should split those papers or whether the enacting motion from the council should be clear that this is the reason we are considering this um, and we would not be considering this uh, without this bike kitchen already in place. Um, and so I think I, I think that's a valid legal reality. I mean, I would be happy to hear from our city solicitor's office if they have a concern about that. Um, but I think that we could, you know, this is why the subject to legal and purchasing review um, provisions are in there, Council Spadafore, to just make sure that our take on this is, in fact, correct. Um, and that, you know, I think if we put in either a 90 day trigger or just to say that, that the city's possession takes effect, um, we, we want to find a way to, to yoke those, yoke the purpose with the receipt of the property without un, unreasonably encumbering the city in the future. So that would be my recommendation there. Um, and, uh, and then if we wanted to add, like I said, some language that made sure that we couldn't proceed receiving the property without, those things in place, I would be open to that. But I would be happy to hear from our city solicitor's office if they have had any additional due diligence on this and have any perspective about whether it's better to intentionally separate these things or intentionally keep them together. Thank you, Councilor McDonald. Uh, before I go to Councilor Sika, I just want to clarify, um, when, it, when it comes to the um, the dividing the papers, um, they, they are two distinct matters, and I, I do believe any a request by any member to divide papers is, is allowed by right. Um, I'm not saying we do that now. Um, I think that there might be a, a, a motion to maybe table, to wait for the legal department to kind of get back to us. That's what I had had a conversation with in the back. Uh, Councillor uh, Sika, uh, for the first time? First time. See, I'm counting. I'm, I'm counting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. Um, I will support dividing this paper. I will not be in support of keeping the paper as is this evening. So if that is what we are going to do, I will not be in support of that. I think Councilor Spadafor is correct. I think that um, I, I don't have an issue with the bike kitchen going there. They're already there. So I don't know why we need to rush this as much as we're, we're trying to at this point. But um, it, it's not just about this it's not the bike kitchen it's i have a empty lot at the end of my street on cleveland street what if somebody came to me and they wanted to do something in particular there like we need to make sure that this precedent that we're setting doesn't affect future things i think councillor taylor has an area that somebody's looking to have a community garden and you, we just need to make sure that those type of things and maybe people are watching and they're seeing oh I can use city land for something for it's not a dollar council of Spadafore, it's 10 uh, the, the the lease was for ten dollars plus taxes so <laughs> um, you know somebody else a different organization might come along so we just need to make sure that you know this is kind of the first time we've been we've been having something like this in front of us we just need to make sure that we're doing it um, appropriately because there are quite a few parcels of city-owned property that are going uh, you know um, unused at the moment that we I think talked about in an open space plan 
a couple of years ago. So I didn't even know there was an empty spot at the end of my street, to be honest, until we started discussing that. But I just don't want, you know, to make anything down the road not okay because we did this. So I am in favor of splitting this paper into two and accepting the land as a gift. But I think that, you know, I, I don't think there's no harm, no foul with breaking it up and tabling that portion because the bike kitchen's already there. They had a grand opening last Friday. Nothing is gonna change. Nobody up here is telling them that they need to get off. I think before we just sign this lease and all that, we need to make sure that our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I was just talking with the clerk about what the how that would kind of work out. Oh, oh yeah. So um, uh, so I, I'm just going to rule that the the papers are divided. Uh, so we have the the first first portion, uh, which goes from. Uh, it basically ends at the parcel number, and then the second portion would be the mayor is authorized to execute an agreement. Uh, so those are the two papers that we have. Um, the, the, the first portion is going to be uh, the 16024 that you see on your docket. Um, the, the second portion is going to be 18424 uh, once we put that new uh, entry. Um, so we're, we would be taking any motions under the 16024, Councilor McDonald. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my request was not to send things back to legal review. I, I like, I, I think these are all such valid concerns. I just think we tried to talk through this in committee, and so I'm not sure what information my colleagues are looking for, and I want to make sure that we're clear about what we're asking for in this. Um, I because we did get an opinion from the legal department and from our transportation planner that you know the the way that we were talking about this and the way we were putting this forward was in order, and and, and so. Um, we can talk more. I don't. I don't know what information we would like uh, on this on this additional agreement piece. Um, and I am also happy to or defer to Council Crow to make a motion to to also approve the first the that the first half of that split paper. And then I would just like to make sure that I understand what it is that we're asking in relation to the second one. Thank you, Council Mayor. Just to clarify, uh, before I go to Councilor Spada, uh, before I go to Councilor Spadafora. Um, the I believe what we are waiting for from committee is a a, a draft deed that would execute the first first portion. Um, I believe we we still need to figure out if the license has renewed to your, to your point um, and what kind of procurement process we would need to follow in order to execute a license or a lease. And I have to personally be like on this because if Councillor Siki, you remember there was the parcel on Route One related to the to the shop up there and we were talking about license or a lease I was kind of being like a stickler about it so I want to make sure that I'm consistent um, it looks like we have no other lights is there a motion on 16024 the just the portion about the property on councillor Crow's motion to what do we do on orders approve adopt the order is there a second seconded by councillor Sika uh, the clerk will call the roll. Councilor Colon Hayes, yes. Councilor Condon, yes. Councilor Crow, yes. Councilor Linehan, yes. Councilor McDonald, yes, Councilor O'Malley, yes, Councilor Sika, yes. Councilor Simonelli, yes. Councilor Spedafora, yes. Councilor Taylor. Yes. That passes. Is there a motion on the second portion, which is now paper? One eight four twenty four. So, so Councillor Crow made a motion to table. Councillor Spadafora for the third time.
be no lease and the liability is going to fall on the city. Again, I'm not trying to make things, you know, hot on like the city. I just want to make sure we do everything by the book. So what I would say is have legal experiment, everybody review it. I would put 30 days they ask us. Oh, my apologies. No. Councilor Spadafora, you didn't, you were not on. Oh, I don't have to say the whole thing. The cops, my colleagues, my colleagues heard me. It's a long night, but I'm just saying, I don't think we, we, we drag this on because now we're going to own the property. It's our liability. So I would say if we can get this done in the next 30 days. So unless, there's a unless procurement uh, kills us. Councillor Crow, and I, I apologize, Councillor Crow, I didn't put you on earlier either. I'm sorry, that's okay. The, um, so I do know that we, we did discuss, as you mentioned, a, a deed and to make sure that we had the proper deed. So even though we voted for that, we really wouldn't take possession until we have the proper deed and the deed executed. So it's not ours yet. We could say, yes, we will take it, but it's, it's not been transferred until those things are executed. Perfect. I think table it makes sense. I think the second part your table. So the, there's a motion to table uh, for I think it might be less than thirty days, but I'll, I'll second the motion, whatever happens. So a motion to table, a second by Councillor uh, uh, Spadafora. Uh, oh, Councillor uh, McDonald, I see you have your hand up. Yeah. So I. I Again, I want to be clear. All this order does now is authorize the mayor to execute an agreement and to do all these reviews. So if we want, do we want us to approve the agreement, which is not a thing that we typically do, or do we just want to see that the mayor and the city staff are, I guess, following the protocol and doing the things that we want them to do? Like, what is it that we want them to do in relationship to us besides provide information? Because... Right now, we would just be tabling the authorization. Are we withholding the authorization until we get more information? Or are we changing the authorization to say we have to approve the lease? In, or excuse me, it's not a lease, it's a license agreement in this situation. I'll be honest with you. Uh, the, the question Councillor Spadafora has presented is, does the lease have to come back to the, to the council? The council is the owner of all public property. We never really assert that power. We might want to. Um, I'm not quite clear what the process is. Um, and I do think it makes sense to take time. Um, I don't think it's going to hurt tabling it. I, I think that the, the, they can always come to us with a proposal, a, a draft of the of the deed and a lease or a license or whatever. Um, there is a motion and seconded on the floor and that's the tabling motion. It takes precedence. Um, I'm gonna call that. On, on the tabling motion, all those in favor, the clerk will call the roll. Councilor Colon Hayes. This is a motion to table. Councillor Condon, yes. Councillor Crow, yes. Councillor Linehan, yes. Councillor McDonald, yes, Councillor O'Malley, yes, Councillor Sika, yes. Councillor Simonelli, yes. Councillor Spedafora, yes. Councillor Taylor, yes. Yeah, Councillor Sika for the second time. Table. I just wanted to um, say you made a valid point. I totally forgot about the um, city-owned parcel next to Cappy's on Route One. I think this would be no different than that. We would have been in charge of executing a lease for that parcel. It would be no different than us executing a lease for this one. So I do believe, although we just tabled it, maybe next time we take it off the table and we send it back to public properties, because I think that's where it should go. I don't think it should have been tabled, but um, I think it's no different than, you know, the agreement that Councilor Taylor would have had. Like, we did an easement or something when Barbara was counselor for, I think might've been that same parcel on Goodwin or where Gordon, what are those G streets in your ward? Um, where the, you know, the homeowner was using our land to actually access their driveway. It was years ago, but I remember that. Yeah, so I think that where we're in charge of those types of things, we, this is no different than than the lot on Bennett Highway or, you know, Gordon or Goodwin, wherever in Ward 5. So I think that 
we should be discussing the lease agreement in public properties. That Thank was a, that was a discussion in, in public properties, and I don't I don't think we quite resolved it. Um, so it's it's helpful to hear the council's thoughts. So the paper is tabled. On, I'm going to go. I think that's the just point point of order, Mr. President. Councilor McDonald. I I I I feel. <laughs> I feel like we have not actually resolved this issue. What is what do we want the city staff to do? And is it true? I, and I would like us to resolve this before we move on, because I think otherwise we're going to end up delaying this a couple of different weeks for procedural reasons that I'm not sure what they are. But can we reflect? Is it is it clear that what we want is a is n answers to these questions and to see a draft agreement before it is signed or authorized? Count, uh, Council McDonald, um, I have been informed by Councilor Sika that that was your fourth time to speak. Um, I, that was a point of order, which is separate in the rules from speaking on true. a particular motion. This is true. And the matters, the matters are done. I think uh, uh, to this Assistant City Solicitor, do you have any questions about what needs to be done? Would you mind addressing the Council just to clarify if, if what we're asking the legal department to coordinate with the other city staff? To me, oh. you're, on? you're on. Yeah. Good evening, so here's to me. So my understanding is, the city council definitely wants to accept this land, and they've authorized an acceptance of a deed. What you want to do with the land, I understand, it's going to depend on whether you want to use it to raise revenue or if you want to use it for a public purpose. If you want it to use it to raise revenue and the value at at stake is above a certain threshold, you're gonna to have to go through an RFP process is my understanding. Um, on the other hand, if you're not really interested in using it to raise revenue, if you wanna use it for a public purpose, like the bike kitchen as it maybe currently is used, then it's a different process. I don't know all the details right now uh, of the two different uh, avenues that you could take with how to use the, the land that you accept as a gift, but that's something uh, the solicitor's office can explore and you know, which purpose you want to use it for will kind of depend on how the license or the lease agreement looks as well. Thank you, Mr. Sammy. Yep. Um, Councilor Spedafora. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and I'm embarrassed, I'm embarrassed to ask this. To the, to the, can, can you tell me what, what is a, and again, I, I'm not trying to be difficult, but tell me what, what, a, what a public purpose would be. So this is a this is the bike to the sea is a is a nonprofit entity that's not part of the city. So we could go to the YWCA and say you can take this piece of property over if you want to teach people how to how to tie tie butterfly knots. I mean, what's a public purpose? Well, that's pretty broad. I mean, it's any if you want to encourage people to use their bikes and use the bike, you know, the bike path and you want to if one way to do that is to basically give the bike to the sea nonprofit organization, you know, um, basically free or near free use of it, just paying taxes or expenses and covering any liability issues, that, that could be, that's a public purpose. I mean, you're not using it to generate, you know, to generate revenue or taxes. Um, or, you, well, they're paid taxes, but you're not using it to generate revenue to make any kind of profit off of it. Um, that, that's a public purpose. I mean. So it could be a, it could be a non city entity that you can gift that to in terms of, not gift, you could, you could give that as a reduced fee. Yes, yes, you could. I mean, if you want, if, if, if there's a nonprofit that's doing good work and you wanna allow, you wanna encourage their work, um, that's part of the city's public purpose. Yeah, yeah. And, again, and again, I just wanna to speak to my colleagues. I don't wanna get into a, a contest, it's very late, but my challenge here, and I, I would yield to the lawyers, public purpose is very subjective to everybody in this council, right? What you might think is a good public purpose, I might not think. And the idea that we just open this up, I think we have to just have a set of criteria that says, yeah, the bike to the sea does a great job. This is the criteria. If somebody comes down the road and says, I want to grow pumpkins there, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's good. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if it's good. But we have to, a council, I'm going to yield to Council McDonald if you want to put a Christmas tree stand there, right? Public purpose, right? Is well, that, you don't have to license for it now. So. Yeah, yeah. Is that within side, is that covered underneath that. And, and again, I think you yield to Council Seeker's point was, yeah, there was a commercial piece of property there, but that is very subjective. All I'm asking is we got to have a set of rules that says, and, and, and I would tell everybody in this council, don't remember, the Emerson School, there was four nonprofits, 
all very good. They all stopped paying t their rent, and we were paying 60000 a month in heating bills. So all did a good, good work, but we had to force them to pay, to pay, which ultimately led to the demise of those organizations leaving that building, and we ended up subsequently selling the school. I'm not trying to be impractical. I'm not trying to be mean to bike the sea. I just want to make sure we do things by the book. We've learned a lot about Robert's Rules today. I just want to make sure whatever we do here, it can be replicated for any type of use. Thank you. Well, so, so the papers are, are resolved. Uh, one is tabled. The other one has been acted upon. I, I'm, I'm just wondering if um, there, there is a desire to get some type of uh, per, something produced or presented to the council that clarifies how does the city accept public property and how do we allow people to use public property? I, Oh, me? Yeah. Public council crow. I, can't, I can't make any motions. I'm just saying, because <laughs> yeah. because Councillor McDonald was asking for some clarification about what are we asking city staff. I'm just wondering if we need to better understand how do we accept public property and how do we allow people to use public property? Because right now, it's not clear to me. Councillor Sika. So since it's in Council of Crow's Wood, why don't we give her the opportunity to find out this information to bring it back to us as the council. She can work with the city solicitor office. If you need a motion for that, I'll make the motion to have Councilor Crow work with the city solicitor's office to figure out the next steps with this lease agreement moving on, forward. On Councilor Sika's motion to uh, empower Councilor Crow to work with the legal department to come up with uh, clarification on what we just discussed, seconded by Councilor uh, Taylor. All those in favor, please, the clerk call the roll. Councilor Colon Hayes, yes. Councilor Condon, yes. Councilor Crow, yes. Councilor Linehan, yes. Councilor McDonald, yes. Councilor O'Malley, uh, yes. Councilor Sika, yes. Councilor Simonelli, yes. Councilor Spedafora, yes. Councilor Taylor. Yes. That passes. Uh, next order of business, I will go get Council President Winslow. Sure, sure, yep. Okay. All right, sure, okay, okay. All right, we are to um, Committee Report 18324. Uh, clerk, we'll read the, the paper. Stand, paper 183-24, the Standing Committee on Personnel and Appointments to whom was referred papers 134 and 135, series of 2024. Having considered the same, make the following report. Committee recommends these papers out favorably to the full council. All right, um, clerk will read the first paper then. So let's say actually, uh, Councilor Colin Hayes motion to receive the committee report, seconded by Councilor uh, Taylor. Um, uh, clerk will take the roll. Councilor Colon Hayes, yes. Councilor Condon, yes. Councilor Crow, yes. Councilor Linehan, yes. Councilor McDonald. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Sika, yes. Councilor Simonelli, yes. Councilor Spedafora. Councilor Taylor. Yes. Council President Winslow. Yes. Okay. Um, so on. Count, uh, let's see. The clerk will read the paper first, and then the council. First Crow. paper is. Count, Colin Hayes. Yeah. Did you want me to read them both together? Yeah. Why don't we read them both together? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Great. <laughs> paper one three four dash twenty four. Council reappointment. Monique Ching, one five three Salem Street, Apartment B R. Malden, Mass of Ward 5, is a member of the Community Preservation Committee, appointed April 19, 2022, term to expire March 15, 2026, and to commence upon confirmation by the City Council. Also, paper 135-24, Council reappointment, Cameron Lane, 11 Grape Street, Malden of Ward 7, as a member of the Community Preservation Committee, appointed January 23, 2020, term to expire March 15, 2026, 
and to commence upon confirmation by the City Council. All right, uh, Councillor Colon Hayes, as uh, for the committee as Vice Chair. Thank you. Oh, all right. Sorry about that. Just yeah, moving know, things along. Yeah, really, I'm going right. to get us out of here. All right. Great. Okay. <laughs> we good? All right. Good. Okay. So um, the uh, Personnel and uh, Appointments Committee met, and we interviewed both Monique Ching and Cameron Lane, and uh, it it was great meeting them both. And I just want to say very quickly that this was the first time that we used or like questions for each can for each um, candidate, I'm going to say, and it, I think that went really well. Um, we each got to ask a question, and this, that the fact that we're going to use these over and over, so it's very fair, and we ask the same questions, is great. So I, uh, we met, and we voted both unanimously out favorably to the floor. All right. Um, <laughs> Councillor Simonelli, your light's on. Mm -hmm. Do you have oh, any? That was from before. All right. <laughs> All right. Councillor Spadafore, right. you yes, mm -hmm. yeah, All right. So... All right, so any uh, discussion of the paper? All right. Second. All right, so on Councillor Colon, he's uh, motion to um, confirm these appointments, seconded by Councillor Crow. Um, clerk will take the roll. For both papers together. Um, do we want to, well, let's, uh, all right, yes, both papers together, okay. Councillor Colon Hayes? Yes. Councillor Condon? Yes. Councillor Crow? Yes. Councillor Linehan? Yes. Councillor McDonald? Yes. Councillor O'Malley? Yes. Councillor Sika, yeah. Councillor Simonelli, yeah. Councillor Spedafora, yeah. Councillor Taylor, yeah. Council President Winslow. Yes, so those appointments are hereby confirmed. Um, we are now, um, the docket is clear. Um, would anyone like to do personal privilege? All right, let's see. Councillor Linehan was first to the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Really quickly, I promised the um, Malden Police Animal Control that I would put a plug in for the rabies clinic that they're going to be doing on Saturday, May 11th. <coughs> Excuse me. It's going to be 10 a.m. to noon at the main fire station, $15 per pet. It's open to Malden residents and non-residents. Um, and you can bring dogs and cats as long as they're on a leash or in a carrier. That's all I've got. All right. Uh, Councillor O'Malley. Uh, just I want to remind everyone that there is a cleanup at Waits Mount uh, this coming Sunday, uh, April 14th at 9 a.m. Uh, after that, uh, some of us will be going to um, Idle Hands for some celebratory drinks after. Um, also, I just want to wish everyone a happy tax day, April 15th. Don't forget to pay your taxes. Okay. <laughs> Any uh, other Councillor Colon? Councillor Colon Hayes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm frantically looking for the flyer. I just wanted to say again that um, the, the weather actually does look good for this Saturday. Here we go. Um, the Fuji Family Fishing Festival with Councillor Linehan too. Where, um, it's a going to be a nice low-key um, educational fishing event. So um, come on down. The weather looks good, 9 a.m. to 12. All right, any other councillors? All right, I will just do a, one myself here. Um, just so happened, um, as I was coming into the the, uh, per, uh, the community engagement uh, committee, that the MBTA was was looking for public comment on new bus signs that were going up. So I have some flyers in various languages. If any councilor would like to have one, but they are doing a survey to just uh, on bus signs. And then I also on a Patriots Day. Um, I just want to point, just wish all, all Maldonians who are running in the Boston Marathon the best of luck. So, um, so everybody enjoy that. And I do have to say on this uh, opening day um, of the 2024 season, the, the Red Sox were honored. I think tonight's comeback of Chuck Iovan was the biggest comeback in the area <laughs> since the Red 20, 2004 Red Sox. So congratulations, Chuck. And... Uh, we will look forward to working you in the future with you in the future. All right. Any further comments? All right. Motion is adjourned by Councilor Crow, second by Councilor O'Malley. All those in favor say aye. Council is adjourned. Thank you. Aye. Right, Thank good. you, Councilor McDonald. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs>